Uh, I'd like to call us back into order and uh, we'll request uh, Dr. Uh, Joe Bikini to go up to the microphone and introduce the HPV session. Thank you, John. Oh, and, and before Dr. Bikini uh, starts, uh, he has been, you know, an essential part of HPV uh, basically as long as I can remember being here. Uh, Joe has been uh, a wonderful leader for this uh, work group, so just uh, accept our, our thanks and gratitude for your uh, years of service. John, thank you. Um, I, I'd also like to point out <clears throat> Lori Markowitz, who I've worked with right from the beginning, and um, all the uh, I think the way this work group um, has been so effective has been clearly uh, considerably the result of her expertise. Thank you. So it, in review for you, the nine-valent HPV vaccine was licensed by the FDA in December of 2014. Uh, we considered it in our shortened uh, ACIP meeting the, that was uh, uh, shortened by CDC being closed uh, uh, because of a scare of, uh, of, of a snowstorm. Um, and, um, uh, and ACIP did vote on the major issues related to the HPV nine-valent vaccine. Um, and the changes that, uh, uh, that were made were then uh, put together in a MMWR policy note, which was published uh, in March, uh, on March 27th. The one issue that wasn't considered was additional vaccination for those who completed an HPV vaccine series. So in review, the uh, related to nine valent HPV vaccine, um, presentations were made to ACIP um, uh, first on the epidemiology and burden of disease, the attributable, attributable disease due to specific HPV types. Clinical trial data was presented in, uh, in three uh, separate meetings. The great analysis was presented in October of 2014, and the health economic analysis, uh, two presentations were made, one in October and then one in February 2015 uh, prior to the, uh, the vote. Discussion of policy options were made, uh, discussions were made in October uh, of last year and then in February, and then the vote occurred, um, the uh, nine valent vaccine recommendations and, and vote um, we're actually in February. Um, the um, work group uh, has continued to meet subsequent to the uh, February uh, meeting um, uh, and um, uh, have reviewed evidence for uh, additional nine valent uh, HPV vaccination uh, regarded again to regarding uh, type specific disease, clinical trial data, and cost effectiveness, and discussed additional transition. Uh, issues uh, that um, that have occurred uh, since the licensure of the vaccine, and then have made considerations for guidance on these issues uh, for uh, providers um, uh, in, in out on the front lines. So um, the um, recommendations uh, for uh, today. This is actually outline of. Uh, uh, today's session <laughs> is uh, uh, Dr. Markowitz will discuss the uh, background, the nine valent transition and clinical trial data. Dr. Harold Chesson is going to discuss the impact and cost effectiveness of additional vaccination. Then Dr. Markowitz will review the considerations that have been made uh, by the work group um, and open a discussion with ACIP. So, Laurie? Last slide. Um, I do want to thank all the members of the work group. This has been a uh, very uh, 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 well uh, uh, run work group, as I mentioned, with Dr. Markowitz uh, being the CDC lead. Um, and I think we've had a number of very serious discussions which have outlined uh, what needed to happen to, to bring these, this information forward to the ACIP. So thank you all. Okay, and I apologize. We were off one ACIP meeting on, on the dates of those last two slides. So that last slide was, of course, the outline for today. Okay, before I start, and I know there have been several mentions of, of Dr. Bocchini's time, both on ACIP and as a chair of the work group, I just want to 
basically mention that again. He's rotating off ACIP and stepping down as chair of our work group. He's been chair of our work group from, since 2011, but he's also been a member of the work group since the inception of the work group in 2005. And so he's really been an integral part of our work group. He was chair of the work group both for the vote on to include males in the routine recommendation schedule for HPV and also for the vote on HPV-9. So he's really played a, a really strategic leadership role. And even though he's stepping down as chair, I'm very thankful that he's going to remain on our work group as a member. So thank you again, Joe. So today, um, what I'm going to do is provide some background and overview of HPV vaccines, um, give a review of the recommendations from February 2015, and then talk a little bit about program transition to nine-valent HPV vaccine. And following that, I'll review evidence on additional nine-valent vaccination, reviewing burden of disease, and the clinical trial data from the one trial of nine-valent vaccine administered after a quadrivalent vaccination series. So just as a review, there are three licensed HPV vaccines in the US. These are, these are all virus-like particle vaccines. The bivalent vaccine targets the cancer-causing type 1618. The quadrivalent vaccine targets 1618 as well as 6 and 11 types that cause genital warts. And the nine-valent vaccine targets the same four types as the quadrivalent vaccine and five additional cancer-causing types. Adjuvant differs between the bivalent vaccine and the adjuvant that is in the quadrivalent and the nine-valent vaccines. And of note, about 99% of HPV vaccine that was administered in the U.S. through 2014 was quadrivalent HPV vaccine. The nine-valent vaccine was licensed in the U.S. in December 2014. It was recommended by ACIP in 2015, and the policy note was published at the end of March. And also, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations that came out in the Red Book in 2015 are consistent with the February ACIP recommendations. Now, while the quadrivalent vaccine was licensed for, for um, females and males 9 to 26, the nine-valent vaccine is currently licensed only for males through age 15. And this is because at the time of first application to FDA, the nine-valent immunogenicity trials in males 16 to 26 had not been completed. However, those data were presented to ACIP in October 2014, and they were later submitted to FDA. And in February, ACIP recommended use of nine-valent vaccine in the currently recommended age groups for quadrivalent vaccine. However, nine-valent use in males 16 to 26 is currently off-label. So the February recommendations that are now in the policy notes state that uh, routine uh, vaccination is recommended at age 11 or 12. Vaccination is recommended through age 26 for females and through age 21 for males not previously vaccinated and for men who have sex with men and immunocompromised men through age 26. Vaccination of females is recommended with any of the three vaccines and vaccination of males is recommended with quadrivalent vaccine or nine-valent vaccine. ACIP recommendations also state that if vaccination providers do not know or do not have available the vaccine product previously administered or in settings transitioning to nine-valent vaccine, for protection against 1618, any product can be used to continue or complete the series in females, and quadrivalent or nine-valent vaccine can be used to continue or complete the series for males. Now I'd like to very briefly discuss some issues that uh, during this transition from quadrivalent to nine-valent vaccine. So again, was, the vaccine was licensed in December. It was recommended by ACIP in February. And the policy note was published in March. And nine-valent vaccine was included in the VFC contract in April. And in May, which was the first time that vaccine could be ordered off the contract, just over 50% of awardees had placed orders that included nine-valent vaccine. 
And according to information from the manufacturer, as of June 2015, over 85% of managed care plans have decided to cover nonvalent HPV vaccine. Also of note, Merck intends to maintain quadrivalent vaccine in the U.S. market until nonvalent vaccine is approved by FDA for use in males 16 to 26 years, and six months have passed from FDA approval for the male 16 to 26 year indication. And because of this, quadrivalent vaccine is expected to be on the market in the U.S. until mid-2016, and this is, of course, pending FDA approval of the 16 to 26 year indication. CDC has provided some suggestions to awardees to assist with implementation during the transition from quadrivalent to nonvalent vaccine. This includes that providers who have quadrivalent vaccine stock in their office but prefer to vaccinate their VFC patients with nonvalent vaccine should be able to order nonvalent vaccine. And for those providers who choose to implement nonvalent vaccine but still have not quadrivalent stock, those doses can be used to complete the series for persons who started the series or can be used in males since the additional protection from nonvalent vaccine will mostly benefit females. Now I'd like to um, discuss for the rest of my talk data on the additional nonvalent question relevant to the question of additional nonvalent HPV vaccination. Again, it was mentioned this due to the abbreviated meeting. This was not discussed in February, and it was not included in the policy note. Um, again, there's no indication for additional nonvalent vaccination in the label, although data are included in the label from the one clinical trial that addresses this. And nine additional nonvalent vaccination has been a common question from pro vaccination providers and parents, both before and after nonvalent vaccine licensure. As, present, as presented to ACIP last year, this slide shows the percentage of cancers at each anatomic site attributable to HPV, the percent attributable to 1618, and the percent attributable to the five additional types in the nonvalent vaccine. And there is variation in the percent of cancers attributable to any HPV by anatomic site, ranging from 63% to over 90%. And the percent of cancers attributable to 1618 ranges from 48% to 80%. And in the last column is the percent attributable to the five additional types in the nine valent vaccine. And this ranges from a low of 4% in oral pharyngeal cancers in males to 18% of vaginal, common, uh, vaginal cancers, one of the less common HPV-associated cancers. This slide shows the estimated annual number of cancers attributable to HPV 1618 in five additional types. And these data are generated from the study I showed on the last slide and the annual number of cases obtained from U.S. cancer registries. The percent attributable, I mean, the number percent attributable to 1618 are shown in gray and to the five additional types in blue. And on the left are the females and on the right are the males, and you can see that the majority of cancers are attributable to HPV 16 and 18 at all anatomic sites, and the largest number of cases due to the five additional types are cervical cancers. This kind of summarizes the data from the last two slides. We think approximately 68 64% of HPV-associated cancers are attributable to 1618 in the U.S., these two types account for 66% of cervical cancers, and the other types, they range from 48 to 80%. 10% overall are, are attributable to the five additional types, 15% of cervical cancers, with a range of 4% to 18% for the other HPV-associated cancers. And due to the differences in the percent of cancers attributable to HPV types at the anatomic sites, there are differences by sex. The five additional types account for about 14% in females and only about 4% in males. And for the cervical precancer lesions of SIN2 or worse, 
about 50% are caused by 16 or 18 and 25% to the five additional types. ACIP reviewed data from the nine valent clinical development program at multiple meetings in 2014. The nine valent clinical development program included efficacy trial in females 16 to 26, immunogenicity and immunobridging trials, concomitant use trials, and then one trial of nine valent vaccine among females who were vaccinated previously with nine valent, and I will review those data today. The objectives of this trial were to evaluate the safety of nine valent vaccine and prior quadrivalent vaccine recipients, to evaluate the immunogenicity of nine valent vaccine with respect to the five additional types. There are about 900 females in this study, which was a double blind randomized controlled trial, and the vaccine was administered on a zero, two, and six month schedule. Antibody was um, measured at enrollment, post dose one, and post dose three. And again, although this study was conducted and the data were submitted to FDA, the manufacturer did not seek indication among those previously vaccinated with quadrivalent vaccine. And this just shows the study design. You can see the prior three doses of quadrivalent vaccine in red, and then there were at least 12 months between the last dose of quadrivalent vaccine and the first dose of nine-valent vaccine. And then the green area shows protocol 006 with the doses administered at a zero, two, and six month schedule. So I'm just gonna summarize briefly some of the data among females randomized to receive nine valent vaccine post dose one, zero positive data types 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58 were 98%, 95%, 68%, 94%, and 99%. Of course, all of these were revaccinated, and we have no information on persistence of antibody after this one dose. Zero were not collected post dose two, and post dose three, over 98% of quadrivalent vaccine recipients were zero positive to all five types. This graph shows the geometric mean titers um, in the vaccinees, with the gray bar being the GMT at enrollment, the blue bar being the geometric mean titer post dose one, and the purple post-dose three. And for the four types that are in the quadrivalent vaccine, 6, 11, 16, 18, there was an increase in antibody post-dose one and no further increase post-dose three. And remember, of course, <clears throat> all of these vaccinees had already received three doses of quadrivalent vaccine targeting these four types. The GMTs for the five additional types appear lower than those for the four original types. Also, there was an increase in antibody after the third dose compared to after the first dose. And below the x-axis, you can see the full difference post-dose three compared to post-dose one. And for all these types except 32, the full difference range from 2.3 to six. The injection site and systemic adverse events that were observed among recipients of nine valent vaccine at a frequency of greater than 1% and also greater than the saline placebo group are shown here. There was also one serious adverse event assessed to be due to vaccine in each group, case of tonsillitis and migraine, and both of these resolved. In order to further assess these results, Data from protocol 06 were also used in a post hoc cross study comparison. And the objectives of this analysis were to compare the safety of nine valent vaccine and prior quadrivalent vaccine recipients with nine valent vaccine and naive females and to compare the immunogenicity in the two groups. And again, this was an unplanned analysis comparing data across studies. This slide shows the geometric mean titers in the cross-study comparison for 16 to 26-year-olds on the top and 12 to 15-year-olds on the bottom. And for each type, the geometric mean titers for those naive to quadrivalent vaccine and those previously vaccinated are shown. And you can see the titers were lower for those who had previously received quadrivalent vaccine with a ratio between 0.3 and 0.6. This slide shows the injection site adverse events days one through five following each dose in protocol 006 and those who received nine valent vaccine but were naive to vaccination in other studies. 
As noted, there appears to be a higher percentage of erythema, 42% versus 32%, and swelling, 49% versus 38% in those who had prior quadrivalent vaccination compared to naive women. So in summary, an updated policy note was published after ACIP voted in February. This was published at the end of March. Nine-valent HPV vaccine was included in the contract in April. The transition to nine-valent vaccine in the public and private sectors is ongoing, and the manufacturer expects quadrivalent vaccine to be in the market until mid-2016. One trial evaluated nine-valent vaccine prior quadrivalent recipients. After three doses, over 98% of prior quadrivalent vaccine recipients were seropositive to all additional types, and there was an acceptable safety profile. In a cross-study comparison of nine-valent vaccine in prior quadrivalent recipients, three doses of quadrivalent vaccine resulted in lower antibody titers compared to three doses of vaccine in naive patients. The clinical significance is unclear as there's no immune correlative protection. And the safety profile was similar except for higher rates of injection site reactions. And I want to thank all of the work group members and the CDC um, staff that assisted with this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Markowitz. Uh, would you like to go on with the uh, uh, Dr. Chesson's presentation and take questions on yeah. both after that? Okay. But Dr. Shuka. Um, just while he's getting the slides up, I think people are looking at their electronic devices. And just to let you know, the Supreme Court issued a ruling on the um, health care reform uh, six to three in favor of upholding it. OK, thank you, Dr. Chesson. Good morning. Before addressing the impact and cost effectiveness of additional nonvalent vaccination among prior three dose quadrivalent recipients, I will start with a brief review of the health economics presentations from the February meeting. At that meeting, we presented a summary of three models of nonvalent vaccination in the U.S. and their respective <coughs> estimates of the cost effectiveness of routine nonvalent vaccination. These are the three models we have available for nonvalent vaccination in the United States. The U.S. version of the HPV advised model was presented by Dr. Mark Brisson at the October 2014 meeting. It's based on a published nonvalent Canadian model and has been calibrated to fit U.S. data. The Merck model and our simplified model are both based on published quadrivalent models that have been expanded to include the additional types in the nonvalent vaccine. These models were used to estimate the cost effectiveness of routine nonvalent vaccination. The specific question they addressed is, what is the cost effectiveness of a routine nonvalent vaccination program for both sexes compared to a routine quadrivalent vaccination program for both sexes? This table shows the cost effectiveness estimates for routine nonvalent vaccination in terms of the incremental cost per quality adjusted life year or quality gained. The results are shown for two scenarios with and without cross protection for the quadrivalent vaccine. In the scenario of cross protection, the quadrivalent vaccine was assumed to provide partial protection against the additional five types in, in the nonvalent vaccine. The first column of results is for the no cross protection scenario. And here, all models suggest that nonvalent vaccination is cost saving compared to routine quadrivalent vaccination. In the scenario of cross protection, again, the model results are quite similar in that the cost per quality gained is quite low. It's less than $0 in the HPV advised model and under $10,000 in the simplified model. So to summarize the results that we've already presented, the nonvalent vaccine for both sexes compared to quadrivalent vaccine for both sexes is likely cost saving. The cost per quality gained is less than $0 in most scenarios we examined, and this was true across all three models. And the cost per quality did not exceed $25,000 in sensitivity analyses. Most of the incremental benefits of the nonvalent vaccination are, are due to vaccination of females. So now I'll move on to the impact and cost effectiveness of additional nonvalent vaccination. The same three models used to address routine vaccination were used to address the cost effectiveness of additional nonvalent vaccination. 
The specific question we addressed is, what is the cost effectiveness of providing three doses of the nonvalent vaccine to females who were previously vaccinated with three doses of the quadrivalent vaccine? This table shows the age and sex of the vaccine recipients. All three models assume that females aged 13 to 18 who had been vaccinated with the quadrivalent vaccine would be eligible for additional nonvalent vaccination. All three models also assumed that additional nonvalent vaccination would be a temporary program and it would take place in the context of an ongoing routine nonvalent vaccination program for both sexes. This table shows the estimated impact and cost per quality gained by additional nonvalent vaccination for all three models. For example, for the HPV advised model, it was estimated that about 1 million females would receive additional vaccination at an incremental cost of 432 million with a gain in qualities of 3,700. This works out to an incremental cost per quality gained of about $117,000. The results for the other models are quite consistent with the results of the HPV advised model. So why is routine nonvalent vaccination so much more cost effective than additional nonvalent vaccination? The incremental benefits are, are, are the same uh, for routine and additional vaccination. Uh, that is, uh, routine vaccina nonvalent vaccination and additional nonvalent vaccination both provide protection against these additional five types shown here. The difference is in the incremental cost per person vaccinated. When we're switching from a routine quadrivalent program to a routine nonvalent program, the incremental cost is simply the difference in the cost of the two vaccines, or about $13 per dose. In contrast, to provide additional vaccination, we incur the entire cost of the vaccine. So the cost per dose is over $134. So the difference in the incremental cost explains the difference in the cost effectiveness of these two vaccination strategies. I'll present results from, for sensitivity analyses from the HPV advised model because that model has performed the most extensive sensitivity analyses to date. The model accounts for uncertainty in the natural history by applying 50 different parameter sets, and each parameter set is run uh, multiple times. The results can differ from one model run to the next due to chance, and 80% uncertainty intervals are calculated from the 10th and 90th percentiles of these simulations. And because the chance effects are relatively large compared to the effects of the additional nonvalent vaccination program, these uncertainty intervals should be interpreted with caution. So this table shows the cost effectiveness of additional nonvalent vaccination from the HPV advised model in terms of the cost per quality gained. And the 80% uncertainty intervals are shown here. Regardless of whether or not cross protection is assumed for the quadrivalent vaccine, the cost per quality gained by nonvalent vaccination ranges from about $7,000 to infinity. And we think these extremes aren't particularly realistic. What is happening is that chance fluctuations in the model simulations are making the additional vaccination look a lot worse or a lot better than it actually is. So we think the actual interval of realistic estimates would be much more narrow than this, but we haven't yet uh, figured out how to do that. So in summary, the cost per quality gained by three doses of nonvalent vaccination prior three-dose quadrivalent recipients is estimates are consistent across the three models as listed here. And as a reminder, these estimates are for the additional nonvalent vaccination of females aged 13 to 18 years, the cost per quality gained by additional vaccination for females over 18 and for males of any age would be uh, much higher. So to conclude, all three models suggest that routine nonvalent vaccination is likely cost saving. All three models also agree that additional nonvalent vaccination would cost more than $100,000 per quality. And the cost effectiveness estimates for additional vaccination could be less favorable than we estimated if, for example, we're able to achieve higher routine nonvalent vaccination coverage than assumed in the models. Or, for example, if the people who receive additional vaccination are the same ones who receive cervical cancer screening. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Why don't we entertain any uh, questions or comments uh, for the two speakers? Yeah, Dr. Karen, Dr. Rungold. And yeah, Dr. So, so I'm wondering about um, the data that we have to suggest that three doses of the nine valent vaccine are necessary. That's what all the economic models are based on. But do we know that we need three? What about two? What about one? What do we know about that? Well, as we've discussed before at um, 
two previous meetings, there is an ongoing trial of two doses of nine valent vaccine. That trial is fully enrolled and I believe the data are being analyzed over the next probably four to six months. That study is looking at two doses administered at zero six month and two doses administered at zero and 12 months in nine to 14 year olds and that is being compared to a three dose schedule in the age group that was in the efficacy trials. So that is, th those data will be forthcoming. Um, I think you saw that in the slide I presented that antibody was determined after dose one in this trial, but not after dose two. And also there's no follow up of the individuals got a single, after the, the one dose. I mean, because they were all revaccinated. They all, I mean, they were all, they all received dose two and dose, dose three. Uh, Dr. Reingold. Yeah, I'm just curious. I know this is uh, contingent on lots of things, but is it possible to estimate how many cancers at different sites would would or would not what would be prevented uh, by giving an additional three dose of nine valent uh, to a, a cohort of women who've received uh, the quadrivalent vaccine? So, in a birth cohort in the United States, how many uh, cervical cancers would be prevented? How many other cancers would be prevented? Yeah, yes, we can do that. So uh, that's something we will we'll do and get back to you on that. And I was going to say that it's a little bit different than, let's say, looking at some other vaccines because the cancers occur far out. And so during that time, there's going to be nine valent vaccine used in the, in the routine program, and there'll be some herd immunity from that. So it's, it's not as totally straightforward as looking at this for some other vaccines. Uh, Dr. Gamelli. Uh, thanks, Dr. Tempty. Actually, my question was pretty much addressed by Dr. Karen's question. As you know, in Canada, we use uh, a two-dose schedule in some provinces, and our dilemma now is what to do with a nine-dose, a uh, nine, nine-valent vaccine. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chesson, uh, just th th this is a hypothetical question, but I I'm curious, given the current level of uptake of uh, HPV4, or, or HPV9 in vaccine naive. Uh, and this is from uh, kind of picking up on what Dr. Campos Oudkol was saying yesterday. What would the effect uh, of uh, 400 million dollars a year being spent to enhance uh, vaccine naive people getting vaccine, uh, i.e., if we could increase the first dose uh, from 50 percent to 70 percent girls? Um, and have a higher rate of completion, uh, does that have much more effect than adding in uh, additional doses and in, in terms of a, a stable amount of public expenditure? Yes, we could certainly look at the cost effectiveness of additional nonvalent vaccination compared to an uh, intervention to increase coverage of routine nonvalent vaccination. We haven't done that yet, but I would, I would bet that you could incur substantial program cost in this intervention to increase routine nonvalent coverage and still come out ahead in terms of cost effectiveness and impact. And the question is there because we're still struggling to get half our population, even one dose, of whichever vaccine it is. And my fear is that programs to revaccinate people are going to target a group that's already getting the vaccine and may not be the group that really needs to be vaccinated in the first place. Any additional questions? Okay. Uh, then if uh, Dr. Markowitz, if you can continue on. Okay, I'll end this session with considerations for guidance. And first, just to summarize what was presented today, there was one randomized trial that evaluated immunogenicity of nine-valent vaccine versus placebo among prior three-dose quadrivalent vaccine recipients. And after the third dose, seropositivity to all five additional types is over 98%. 
Uh, there was no formal non-inferiority immunobridging evaluation, but in an unplanned cross-study comparison, the GMTs for the five additional types were lower than the geometric mean titers after nine valent in vaccine-naive females, and the clinical significance is, is not known, as I mentioned, because there's no correlative protection. There's no safety concerns apparent in the cross-study comparison. There were high rates of injection site reactions compared to nine valent vaccine vaccine-naive females. Uh, the benefit of protection against the five additional types would be mainly for females, and that is for prevention of cervical cancers and precancers. And the cost per quality gained is estimated to be over $100,000 for additional three doses among females 13 to 18. And the cost would be higher for females over 18 and for males of any age. And in contrast, the models have shown that routine nine-valent vaccination for females and males in the U.S. is cost savings compared to a quadrivalent vaccination program. The work group felt that the highest priority was raising nine valent coverage for the routine series, and a variety of programmatic issues were considered. I think, as was mentioned, and most ACIP members know, 2013 coverage for 13 to 17 year olds for one dose was just about 57 percent, and for three doses, 38 percent. So there's a lot of work that has to be done to raise coverage in the U.S. The economic analyses uh, were reviewed, and considerations varied in the work group. Some work group members placed more weight on the health economic considerations than, than others. Uh, the work group also noted that cervical cancer screening continues to be recommended for women age 21 through 65, and this is the same for vaccinated and unvaccinated women. The work group members were not in favor of a routine additional nine-valent vaccination of persons who previously completed a three-dose HPV vaccination series. However, it was felt that guidance and information are needed in a variety of areas, and this is, includes persons who started the series with another vaccine product, and even though we, we do have information in the policy note, um, further guidance was felt to be needed. Uh, also for persons who completed a three-dose vaccination series, and work group members also felt it was important to clarify what data are and are not available related to additional vaccination. Um, as I mentioned before, questions about additional vaccination have been common both before and after licensure. And some providers and parents are interested in additional protection against the five types. And others, though, may just be seeking information about guidance and remember the PCV 713 transition. And there are a variety of differences between that transition and the HPV vaccine transition. I wanted to just review some of those briefly. First of all, for HPV, there is no indication in the label for additional doses of nine valent vaccine. And in contrast, for PCV 13, there was an indication in the label for a supplemental dose, and there was some specific guidance on interval dosing in the label. For HPV, the trial evaluated three doses of nine valent after three doses of quadrivalent, or for the PCV13, there were a variety of different combinations that were evaluated. The estimated cost per quality gain for the nine valent, additional nine valent is higher than the estimated uh, cost for the supplemental dose of PCV13. And also importantly, the transition from quadrivalent to nine valent is relatively slow. While there was a rapid transition to PV, PCV13, and the manufacturer swapped out doses of PCV7 for PCV13 during that transition. So before I actually discuss what type of guidance is, is going to be, or we're suggesting be communicated, I want to mention that there are, are no plans for an additional policy note since we did publish one in March. And the suggestion is that the information be posted on the CDC website and that there'll, there'll be a link from the ACIP website recommendation page to this information. And also there'll be an, an announcement in the MMWR also with a link to the online information. So what I'd like to do now is show some examples of guidance for providers that has been drafted, and this includes these three basic different scenarios. One is for persons who start the series with another product, for those who have completed a series, and also some examples of the type of information relevant to these, two, uh, these different situations that would be made available. 
Again, the, the I, suggestion is that this guidance be in the form of Q and A's. And these are draft, and the actual wording, of course, will change slightly for clarification and communication purposes. But in the situation of vaccination for persons who start the series with another product, a question would be, if a series was started with quadrivalent vaccine or bivalent vaccine, can it be completed with nine-valent vaccine? Yes, ACIP recommendations state that nine-valent vaccine may be used to continue or complete a series started with a different vaccine product. And this, of course, is something that is in our policy statement. Are additional nine-valent HPV vaccine doses recommended after a series started with quadrivalent or bivalent vaccine and completed with nine-valent vaccine? There is no ACIP recommendation for additional nine-valent HPV vaccine doses for person who started the series with quadrivalent or bivalent and completed the three-dose series with a nine-valent vaccine. Another question that has come up is if a series was started with quadrivalent vaccine or bivalent vaccine and will be completed with nine-valent vaccine, what are the intervals for the remaining doses in the three-dose series? The current recommended HPV vaccination schedule is for the second dose to be given two months after the first dose and the third, months four, third dose four months after the second dose or six months after the first dose. ACIP does not state maximum intervals between HPV doses. Antibody titers have not been found to be diminished after longer than standard intervals between doses. And data from other HPV vaccine studies show equal or higher antibody titers antibody titers when two doses are administered at an interval of six months compared to two months. And then here we do mention that there's an ongoing immunogenicity study evaluating two doses of nine-valent vaccine separated by an interval of six or 12 months. For the situation of vaccination of persons who completed an HPV vaccination series, here the, the main question is, is additional HPV vaccination with not, is additional vaccination with nine-valent HPV vaccine recommended for persons who have completed a three-dose schedule with either quadrivalent or bivalent vaccine? There is no ACIP recommendation for routine additional nine-valent vaccination of persons who previously completed a quadrivalent or bivalent vaccination series. If a person desires protection against the five additional types prevented by the nine-valent vaccine and has completed a three-dose series of quadrivalent vaccine, what issues should be considered? The benefit of protection against the five additional types targeted by nine-valent HPV vaccination is mostly limited to females for the prevention of cervical cancers and precancers. This is because only a small percentage of HPV-associated cancers in males is due to the five additional types in the nine-valent vaccine. Available data show no serious safety, safety concerns in persons who are vaccinated with nine-valent HPV vaccine after having received a quadrivalent HPV vaccine. And cervical cancer screening is recommended beginning at age 21 and continuing through age 65 years for both vaccinated and unvaccinated women. Uh, then, and I, you have some of these on your slides, but I'm not gonna go over them. We would have information also to address these two questions, what data available on efficacy and immunogenicity of nine-valent HPV vaccination for the five additional types when administered after a complete three-dose series of another va vaccine product, and what data are available on the safety of the nine-valent vaccination when administered after a complete three-dose series of another HPV vaccine product. And there could be other informational questions as well, but these would again be posted on the CDC website. I'm not gonna go over those. And so I'd like now to open this up for ACIP discussion. What is your uh, feeling about the overall approach? Are additional questions or information needed and other comments? Thank you very much, Dr. Markowitz. Uh, open this up for any uh, comment or discussion. Now, Dr. Middleman and then Dr. Ornstein. Uh, Amy Middleman from SAM. I'm just curious to know from our insurance colleagues and BFC, I think the big concern that we have as an organization is that adolescents who would like to have revaccination, um, which we think will probably be few, but um, those who, who do, we want to make sure that there's no discrepancy in terms of who can afford it and who cannot. And um, I'd be curious to know from the insurance um, arena what, I mean, I'm assuming with VFC, since it's approved, use is approved, that it would be covered, but um, I'm curious to know from insurance companies what their policies might be 
Yeah, my understanding is that this would cover a three-dose series regardless of the combination. Beyond that, if, if the committee approves this, I, I assume this is, would be a B recommendation or perhaps no recommendation is what I'm understanding, that it offers no significant additional advantage, then that may be a uh, patient cost responsibility. That, that would be what I would assume. Dr. Ernst? Uh, th that was exactly my concern, is at least the way I read this, is one would have to pay out of pocket to get that, and if there, I don't know, uh, I looked at your numbers, it looked like about 3,000 cancer cases might be preventable. I, I wasn't, I may have those numbers wrong, but it looked like that from the uh, figures you presented. Uh, we've made a big deal about other diseases. That, I mean, this, this is cancer. That's been one of the big concerns we've had is, is people not recognizing what HPV really does, and to not even have a Category B recommendation, I think raises concerns about preventable serious disease. Uh, and I think that, there, in my opinion, there ought to be at least a Category B recommendation. Uh, Dr. Kimberlin. Uh, David Kimberlin, AAP. Uh, to, to build on Dr. Ornstein's uh, comment, uh, and, and to tie in, Dr. Markowitz, with, with one of your comments earlier, um, it, in one of your earlier slides, this is going to be a question, already is a question, that families are asking, that pediatricians are asking. I think the academy is going to need to provide some guidance. Um, it, this is a situation different, perhaps, than the, the argument I was making yesterday with, with a different vaccine. But I think what Dr. Ornstein is, is illustrating very much ties in with Dr. Tempty's co uh, comment yesterday about the other vaccine considerations. Uh, if there's no recommendation and there is information out there that the vaccine is safe and that it adds some degree of effectiveness or efficacy, um, then the people that can afford it will get it and those that cannot will not. Whereas a Category B recommendation from the ACIP would tie in those funds um, and would uh, equalize that potential discrepancy. Um, the Academy would be interested in um, working with the work group to develop such language if, if the ACIP were interested. Uh, Dr. Moore. Thanks, Kelly Moore. AIM, uh, I'd like to add my voice to those, uh, Dr. Ornstein and others, who are suggesting that the committee and working group consider a Category B recommendation here, especially in light of the discussions and numbers we looked at yesterday. Um, it seems like these numbers are actually rather favorable in the volume of cancer cases that could be prevented, although not sudden and dramatic out of the blue deaths, um, are agonizing deaths for families of young uh, young adults around the country, and, and if there are those who wish to avail themselves of additional safe protection to prevent that risk even more, uh, I think we should find ways to make that opportunity available to them. I have Dr. Freyhofer and Dr. Harrison. So. Um, Sandra Freyhofer for American College of Physicians. Laurie, thank you so much for putting together this guidance statement. I think it's very helpful for practitioners. When do you anticipate you can have it up on the website? I think it could be fairly quickly. Um, I haven't discussed this w in, in detail, but I think it should be fairly qu quick in, in, in the matter of, of weeks to have it up on the website. And of course, it would take a little bit longer to have the announcement in the MMWR that would link to it, but that can be done fairly quickly in terms of posting. Dr. Harrison and then Dr. Alt. Yeah, did the working group discuss the pluses and minuses of a Category B recommendation? Yes, uh, we did, and we actually did, did grade this as well. So that, that, has, that was discussed within the work group. Could you summarize? There were some people in favor and, and some people that were not in favor. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, you know, I, I'm, I wanted to actually ask Dr. Shuckett if she wanted to make any comments about that. You know, I, I would like to make comments, but I'm wondering if additional uh, ACIP members should make their comments first, because I, I don't want to influence that. So, uh, but I'm happy to make comments whenever you want me. Uh, Dr. Alt. I had a question for Dr. Chesson. I think he has a publication in the past year or two that says out of the $6 billion we spend on HPV-related cancers, we spend about $5 billion just screening for cervical cancer. 
is that in the model as well? I mean, it's not just cancer, correct? It's all the money we spend on minor pap smear abnormalities and cervical dysplasia and that type of thing. Yes, the models do take into account the vaccine's effect on reducing the cost associated with screening, but the models do assume that cervical cancer screening will continue into the future. Okay. Uh, Dr. Riley? And then. So, um, with all due respect to trying to stamp out as much cancer as possible, um, I think that if we put all of our energy, money, time, interest into vaccinating more women or more young girls and boys, um, we may in fact get much further. And I feel very strongly that um, spending uh, lots of energy on that population that's already been fully vaccinated um, really diverts our attention. And we have tried so many things so far only to get 50% of the eligible people vaccinated, I, I really think we need to put our energy into getting a much greater number of people vaccinated. And that will in, indeed make a huge difference. Uh, Dr. Bologna. Yeah, thank you. So I'd like to just follow up on some of the comments that were made regarding the issue of equity and the, the fact that there is some benefit to getting additional uh, doses with nine valent and some people can afford that and some people can't afford that. And I understand, but if you take that principle then you sort of apply that more generally, then I think you have to logically reach the conclusion that every vaccine licensed by the FDA should at least get a category B recommendation because they're safe and, and effective. Is that where we want to go? Uh, just keeping track, I have Dr. Middleman, Dr. Harrison, Dr. Baker, and Dr. Sawyer. So uh, hopefully I'm catching everybody, but uh, Dr. Middleman. I just want to echo again, Sam really supports the immunization of one kind or another. We do want the, um, the focus on getting everyone immunized at least once. Our concern is the equity concern, and we really want to make sure that there is not a disparity when, when there are some patients who truly do want to be revaccinated. We are not suggesting that the focus move to revaccination. We're suggesting that it be an option available to those who desire it. Uh, Dr. Harrison. Well, that was my question. Is it, is it a zero-sum game? In other words, if we have a category B, does the, and I fully recognize that we are woefully, we're doing really poorly with just getting people vaccinated, but does it, if we have a, just a category B, not a category A, a category B, does that divert attention away from the question that Dr. Riley is bringing up, which is focusing on getting uh, kids immunized with one vaccine? Uh, I, I, do you, well, I have Dr. Baker. I, I'm tr going to try and Dr. Baker. Just a quick question to Dr. Markowitz. So you mentioned that you would have some more data potentially by the October meeting. I certainly understand lack of consensus in a work group, <laughs> and sometimes it's because there's not enough data to, to get there. Do you anticipate that the data will help at all with the discussion? Well, the I'm not 100% sure we will have those data in October. I was hopeful that, I mean, I talked about from the two-dose trial. The two-dose trial, as I said, enrollment, as far as we know, is complete and follow-up is complete, but we, we haven't been given a guarantee that we will see those data in October, maybe in February at the latest. But um, again, those I think those data will be helpful. They're not specifically relevant to the additional vaccination question because those are in vaccine-naive individuals, and we know that the antibody titers are lower in people who have received nine-valent after quadrivalent. The other thing I want to point out that all these data, including the Canadian recommendation for two doses and other places have gone to two doses, they're just for the nine to 14-year-olds. So the two-dose recommendation, based on the studies that are being done and the regulatory agencies, are not going to be done, are not going to be for, the, um, for people over age four, 15 and older. I think they might help. They, they might help, but they're not directly applicable. But they, they will certainly shed light on, to this, on this discussion. Uh, Dr. Sawyer. 
To Dr. Middleman's point about equity, I just want to clarify, is it correct that a provider can give as many VFC vaccines as they want if there's no recommendation? Can I give 10 MMRs and have all of them covered by VFC, for example? We need a VFC person to answer that question. Uh, do, do, you have, is, do you have an answer to that? Uh, well, you sort of, I mean, we run the VFC program in Tennessee and we don't count the number of doses that you're giving. You just tell us how many you need to order. So we're not going back and looking at individual patients. Now, if you routinely did that all the time and someone reported you, we might have to have a conversation. Um, <laughs> but we're not routinely looking at, at each patient and making sure you only gave the required number of doses to each patient. You have to keep in mind, Dr. Sarr is in California, and they've had a problem with measles lately, so we can understand his <laughs> question. Uh, Dr. Bennett. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the equity issue. It's, it's a very important one, I think, and, and one that we always need to consider. But I just wanted to point out that this reminds me a little bit of the Virginia Slims uh, advertisements about you've come a long way, baby. And that was about equity in smoking. So it seems to me that the work group has determined that giving additional doses is not valuable. And so I don't think we should be worrying about equity for something that we don't think is the right thing to do. I'm seeing a lot of interest amongst not only the members but amongst the liaisons and it, it seems as though this might be something uh, best to go back to the work group for uh, further consideration, given that, so succinctly put by Dr. Markowitz, there were, were some people interested in and some people not interested in. Um, Dr. Shukin. Um Yeah, I just want to make a comment that um, the um, uh, the, the issue of uh, the, the FDA of approval of the nine valent was not for the indication of revaccination. And the transition plans are going to be, you know, somewhat prolonged compared to what we saw with the PCV713 swap out. And so from the CDC perspective, we view um, implementation guidance different from ACIP policy, implementation guidance in terms of the ordering that the states do and, and so forth as something that we have a, a bit of a responsibility to take care of. And so the idea of posting commonly asked questions and answers in this transitional period where some people have gotten some products and but the doctor might have a different product in the office as why we really are you know, expecting to post some guidance for these common questions quite soon. So I just want to put that out there that um, this isn't even an FDA approved indication that ACIP is trying to figure out what to do with. This is a commonly asked question from clinicians and programs that we'd like to get um, uh, both information out about what the evidence base is and practical answers out. Um, so that's just explaining what, what the plan had been. Dr. Bikini. I just want to clarify a little bit about um, the deliberations in the work group. It, it wasn't really that it wasn't considered that the, the nine valent vaccine didn't add benefit. It's clear it adds benefit. I think the issues that have been discussed are really the key issues that they were related to strong opinions in the work group as to whether focusing on revaccination or allowing revaccination would take away from the primary purpose, which is to get, get people vaccinated in the first place. And there were strong opinions on both sides. And, and actually, if the February meeting was not truncated, the presentation was going to include, as, as, as Lori said, discussion, information about great analysis of doing one or the other, um, and also then showing the work group that there was some differences of opinion in, in showing the ACIP that there were differences of opinion in the work group and asking the ACIP to weigh in on it and, and give your recommendations about a category B recommendation. So that was the original plan. And so we've modified that based on what happened. And so it's certainly reasonable for us to go back and, and provide you with that additional information and help the ACIP make that decision. Uh, Dr. Rubin. 
Yeah, and also, I guess the two things aren't mutually exclusive. Guidance could be provided, and subsequently, a decision on a, a category B could be made. I, I think at this point in time that going forward, uh, the intent uh, is that the guidance will be provided, uh, and and that uh, will. And, and to be honest, as a clinician, I find everything you put together very, very helpful. Uh, and I, I think, in practical terms, it's what a lot of us are already doing. Uh, so I, I think that's that's very, very helpful. And I guess the the question then becomes, uh, does the do the voting members feel that we should put additional effort and, and time into this? Uh, in terms of, we try de desperately not to use Category B recommendations very often, uh, but whether or not we uh, feel strongly that we want to uh, invest the time uh, further down the line for, for this discussion. And I, I, do, do we have any consensus here? Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I think out of uh, uh, respect to my colleagues who are continuing, I'm, I'm going to stand moot on this point. Uh, but whether or not this is something that uh, is of consideration. Um, yes, Dr. campos -Huckle. This is a question on po uh, process. So if we do nothing today, we've, been, we've um, basically what they've suggested is enforced, right? Yeah, th and th there's good precedent here. For example, with uh, Zoster vaccine, we had a no vote on a consideration of changing the age. Uh, on Tdap, we had a no vote on consideration of revaccination, and by not taking a vote, we uh, affirmed our current policy. By doing nothing here, we would affirm the fact that we recommend one of the three vaccines. We uh, uh, don't express any uh, preference for any one of the vaccines, but we also, at the same time, acknowledge that our clinician friends are really, really smart people and make good decisions. Uh, and uh, we also do not... Uh, uh, go beyond the FDI licensure in terms of uh, promoting revaccination. So, so those who may not be in agreement with that should either make a motion to send it back to the work group to come back in the future or make a motion to make it a B recommendation. Otherwise, it's going to stand as proposed. I said Dr. Herman's hand up and Dr. Harrison. I was just going to ask if you could show the language again regarding advice for somebody who's already received three doses of another vaccine and because I think it just said there's no guidance or something, no recommendation. It doesn't, it doesn't say that they recommend, that ACIP recommends against it, it just says that there's, there's, no, there's no ACIP recommendation for routine additional vaccination, that's how we've stated that. And then we do have another question about what needs to be considered if someone thinks they do want protection. And one of the reasons we wanted to include this is to really let people know that for males, right. there's really very little additional protection. Um, and, and, that, and, and what data we have on, on safety right now. So, so, so that was one of the reasons. And again, this, you know, so, so those are the two guidance questions related, I think, to the question that you're raising. Yeah, but at least it does mention that there's benefit for females. I don't know if that should be stated any more strongly, but... I, I think the work group has done a tremendous job of providing very thorough guidance there. Uh, Dr. Harrison. Yeah, I guess I would favor a further discussion about the possibility of a B recommendation, and I... And I where I personally would need a lot of guidance is the question I asked before is it, would there, and I'm again very sensitive to this issue of getting you know, persons vaccinated, would a category B have a negative effect on the efforts to get people vaccinated with a first series, with a paid uh, vaccine? Dr. Shuckett. Um, 
I, I'm not going to answer that, but I wanted to just raise one point that um, I think it's important for the committee to remember uh, whatever you do today, you're not going to get rid of HPV and there's, in terms of this topic coming up for you because we are expecting additional future deliberations and committee recommendations uh, either this fall or next winter about the number of doses and interval issue which is expected to have more data. So I just mention that because the question of what is revaccination is, is probably um, related to what is primary vaccination. Um, and I do appreciate the um, support for guidance coming out quickly, you know, just commonly asked questions being addressed in this very unusual period we're in right now where, where all the vaccine products are out there and some people have gotten, you know, one dose or two doses of what we currently recommend as a three-dose series. Um, but you, you as a committee will probably be asked to look at alternative intervals, alternative number of doses, and possibly differences by age. So I think when you add in what you want to do about the question of revaccination, there's a whole lot of permutations out there for clinicians to absorb. So I just, just say that because you, you'll get to come back at this topic um, or put in other ways, you have to come back to HPV vaccination recommendations in the future, whether you want to or not. Uh, th there's one person up the microphone and then Dr. Riley. Lynn Batta, Minnesota Department of Health. Um, and this was a question I asked my CDC counterparts in a webinar that they gave, but in February, ACIP voted to recommend either two valent or four valent or nine valent vaccination, but all of a sudden now we're concerned that we can't do revaccination for nine valent. That would suggest to everyone that they were inadequately vaccinated for two valent or four valent. And that, that's a message, that's an indirect message in having this conversation. I don't know if it's right or not, it's just the message it sends. And, and again, I think the, the current policy is that we don't express a preference. Uh, Dr. Hahn? Yeah, actually that's similar to my comment actually. Um, as a parent of an 11-year-old girl, I'm going to make sure my child gets the nine valent and I do feel that we're in an odd position to be talking about this conundrum. And there might be people today starting on the four valent as per our current recommendations. And I was wondering as far as the guidance piece, um, would we want to add a question about for a new person walking in today, um, since the transition is towards the nine, do we want to emphasize that children starting today, um, other than the non-licensed group, I understand that concern, but uh, for uh, most young children, they should be started on the nine valent. Are we doing enough we can to make sure we don't have more children and more children vaccinated with the starting series now with the, with the quadrivalent? I think, again, as, as was mentioned, we're in this very awkward period of, of transition from quadrivalent to nine-valent, and not all providers have nine-valent vaccine. Um, and I've, I've heard different stories. I mean, the transition is not going to be immediate. So I think the program has been leery to tell providers to delay vaccination. I think it is a very difficult transition period because of this long delay. And I know that many people share your feeling about that. And I guess the main way to solve that is to get nine valent into offices quicker and make sure that it's available. If I, if I might just follow up, I'm, I think with flu vaccine at one point, we used language about if you have both in the office, uh, preferentially uh, using one in certain situations, and that might be a way to address that. Some providers might have quadrivalent for some of their boys or for filling, f finishing up series. Uh, but encouraging them to also have nine valent available for the new folks walking in. Uh, something along those lines could be done, I think. Uh, Dr. Lett and then Dr. campos um, um Thank you, Susan Lett, Massachusetts. Maybe, maybe we could ask the manufacturers to tell us how they think this, I mean, I'm sure maybe the working group knows this, and I know what's happening in Massachusetts and know that we've made a quick transition in Massachusetts. But, may, but I don't know what's happening in the rest of the country. And, and so 
Um, you know, I've heard that there's plenty of non-valent vaccine available for ordering, and or, at least I think that's true. So maybe we could just get some clarification about that, and if we're going to try to have a, you know, a statement about trying to transition offices over to non-valent as much as possible. I, I don't know if there's anyone from program who, who can address that. I think it would be more from Merck if somebody could comment. Yeah, my question would be for, this, for them also. Um, we went through this before with PCV7 and PCV13, where the manufacturer, I believe, agreed to exchange. I don't know whether that actually happened or not, but that was, has that same arrangement been made here? Didn't? Kathy Garrett from Merck. Um, I'd like to comment that we don't have any issues currently with supply, so the vaccine is available. Um, we don't have currently an exchange program um, available. And um, was there other information that was desired at this time? Excuse me? Well, I can take your question under advisement why we don't have an exchange program. I was just asking, this is Bill Schaffner from the NFID. You don't have an exchange program available. Why not? I think our expectation is that since we don't currently have an indication for males above the age of 15, that the four-valent vaccine could be utilized to complete those boys that had begun or that are beginning the series with the four-valent vaccine. And Dr. Riley. So this is just a quick um, question for maybe the modeling. Is there a way to figure out um, if you did this revaccination and, three th and saved 3,000 more cervical cancers, what happens to those 3,000 cervical cancers if, in fact, we were more successful at vaccinating primarily a greater percentage of the population? I'm not sure I articulated that very well, but did that make sense to people? what I'm trying to get at. I, I mean, I, I guess my question is, is it really 3,000 that we would be, um, you know, preventing just by this vaccination, or would we actually be much better off by vaccinating 70 or whatever the numbers were elsewhere? Um, so yeah, I, I don't know where the 3,000 number came from, but we can certainly look at different scenarios of routine vaccination coverage and additional vaccination coverage and explore the trade-offs, look at the implications for cervical cancers and other cancers under both scenarios. Uh, Dr. Herman. I guess I just don't see where one negates the other. Everybody's efforts can still go into, you know, getting people vaccinated with the primary series. And for those few people that want to get revaccinated, to me, one doesn't supplant the other. And I can't imagine it would really affect the other. But maybe I'm missing something. Uh, Dr. Shuckett? Yeah, just uh, I think, I think um, Dr. Chesson will be able to model this out more precisely. But just to clarify, I think the 3,000 number might have been someone rounding up for 2,800 cancers in girls, in women that are uh, in the five types or attributable to the five types. But remember that that's per year. But remember, that's not among people who had received three doses of quadrivalent, you know, 20 years earlier or something. That's the total universe. Um, and of course, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that go into how he would end up with the modeling. So I don't think the 3,000 is a number to focus on. And Dr. Kemp? Yeah, I just, I think that there are some issues about how um, making a B recommendation could actually affect um, the, the receipt of uh, nine valent among those who are unimmunized. I think somebody brought it up earlier. It sends a message to programs, to physicians, that, that the nine valent um, is a priority to, to it, that it becomes much of a, more of a priority to revaccinate. I think it is uh, likely to send an important message. You know, I mean, I think everybody's torn about this, and it really comes down to um, coverage. 
you know, because we wouldn't be, these, these guidelines say already, yes, it's beneficial, yes, people should use individual discretion, but what we're really talking about here is, in, you know, is making sure there isn't inequity in coverage. I just want to be clear on that point. And, and number two, I do think there's reason to think that a B uh, recommendation does affect the way physicians, organization systems will deliver the program. I see no additional hands up. I, I, I'm trying to summarize the comment. Uh, overall, especially from the liaisons, uh, what I heard was uh, a lot of interest in the possibility of a Category B recommendation. I, I think there's, it's a little bit more equivocal around uh, the table here with ACIP. Uh, but I would suggest uh, that this go back to the HPV work group uh, for further consideration at this point in time. Is that, uh, I'm just looking for more kind of a, a nod of heads here around the table if that's something that, I, I, I've, I've heard three or four people who are very positive about a Category B. Uh, some others who are much more interested uh, in trying to enhance, uh, for example, a lot of what NVAC and the National Vaccine Program Office are doing in terms of trying to increase their dreadful uptake of, of this vaccine. So uh, if that's, yeah, Dr. Belongia. Just if I understand, you know, some of kind of the key issues, one is equity and then, and then sort of on other issues, which I think you were alluding to is that a Category B recommendation could potentially lead to sort of a lot more sort of focus on uh, additional vaccinations of people who have already completed a primary series beyond sort of what ACIP really intended or wanted, but to sort of address the equity issue primarily. And, and would that sort of come at the expense of potentially getting more people a, a primary vaccination series? So I, I'm going to pick on Dr. Bikini as the uh, current chair of the work group. Is that an acceptable course? And, and with uh, Lori uh, up there as well, because I, I don't want to commit you to anything that I'm not going to be around here for. So. Well, again, I could uh, I, I could make that same. Well, we're going to we're going to draft you for and, the and, HPV uh, work group. <laughs> but my I, I think that um, it, it, the work group would be happy to provide additional information and work through, as Lee suggested, the pros and cons of a B recommendation so that all the data would be before the ACIP to help um, make that decision. That, that sounds very acceptable. And going forward, uh, but the intent is still to provide this information uh, on the website for, for guidance for the clinicians in the interim. Dr. Shukin. Um, since people are giving the work group more to do, I, I think uh, as one of the state program comments mentioned, if there's, if if the this is going to be taken back to the work group, the work group probably also needs to reassess what they want to do about preference, because there'll be some in, intrinsic inconsistencies if there's something going forward on, if you got all three doses or a complete series of X this is what you should do with why. You're, you're going to need to reassess whether you want to have a preference among the licensed products. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and I think that in everything that we've done, it's that if a person wants additional protection against these five types other than 16 and 18, and I think that would continue to be the focus, that if a person wants that type, additional protection. And ultimately, I think the strong message needs to be the, the important thing is initial use of one of the three vaccines uh, in expanding the coverage, uh, because I think that's where the, the true benefit lies. Okay, well, that, that's very helpful, and we will move forward with trying to get this guidance available on the website and, and bring back these issues to the work group. So that's very, very helpful discussion. Uh, thank you very much. And let's uh, now uh, have Dr. Reingold come on up. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, whether or not uh, Rich, or Robert Benjamin uh, is still around. And uh, if you are, uh, who signed up for public comment, uh, we can take your comment here while we're waiting.
Okay, Dr. Uh, Rangold. So I guess we're now running about 40 minutes late, but this is a topic that was um, moved uh, to this meeting because, again, of the uh, false alarm over the snowstorm at uh, the last meeting. Um, so um, the Pertussis Work uh, Group uh, has been in existence for a while. Uh, it has a number of members. I won't, I'm going to try and truncate my remarks so we have as much time as possible for the actual presentations. Um, <clears throat> basically, the terms of reference uh, are to coalesce and update all of the statements regarding uh, the diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus uh, recommendations, the epidemiology of tetanus and diphtheria, but obviously most of the focus uh, is on pertussis uh, and particularly around pertussis vaccination um, and uh, a number of questions relating to the ways to maximize the benefit uh, we can with the existing vaccine that we all now recognize has certain limitations. Um, we have uh, two DTAP uh, products that are licensed for single use. Um, the current ACIP recommendations are for a single uh, Tdap dose for all persons ages 11 and older with a preferred administration at 11 or 12 years of age. Pregnant women are currently recommended to receive a dose of Tdap with every pregnancy. Um, and there's a decennial TD uh, booster for those who received a single dose of, of Tdap. Uh, we're generally doing uh, pretty well at getting uh, adolescent uh, Tdap doses in, um, and clearly in, in childhood uh, DTAP doses, but not very well in terms of adult uh, Tdap. <clears throat> um, clearly, the ACIP has heard before uh, uh, about the very important question of the safety of uh, a vaccine administered to pregnant women. Um, and uh, you may recall we had a, uh, uh, we've had presentations about vac from the vaccine safety group uh, about doses uh, and, and reports through VAERS uh, among uh, uh, pregnant women. Uh, there are no safety signals identified uh, at the moment in terms of ongoing monitoring. I believe the safety people are here if people have specific questions about that. Uh, we did hear a presentation at a prior meeting about a possible a relationship with an increased risk of chorioamnionitis uh, related to uh, receipt uh, of the vaccine. Uh, there are additional analyses in, in progress um, concerning chorioamnionitis, um, and there's also a CESA project uh, doing a prospective observational clinical study of Tdap safety in pregnant women. Uh, but um, just to remind you, in June of 2013, uh, uh, information were present, was presented uh, to uh, ACIP suggesting that uh, additional doses of Tdap beyond the one uh, booster would be a very limited public health impact. That manuscript, I hope, is getting close <laughs> to publication. It's still in clearance, is my understanding. We're about to go into clearance here at CDC. Um, and in 2013, there was no change made to the current Tdap recommendation. The focus was clearly on preventing pertussis in infants uh, through vaccination of, of pregnant women. Um, the working group was asked to consider the question of additional doses in healthcare personnel and in the context of contacts of infants or the cocooning strategies. In October of 2014, uh, basically, uh, it was uh, the, what we were presented was that there was no supportive evidence that additional doses would be beneficial in preventing disease and transmission in the healthcare setting. So no recommendation was made to change uh, the situation with regard to vaccination of healthcare workers. Uh, and today we're going to hear two presentations. Uh, one will be by Jennifer Liang, who has done extraordinary work in support of this uh, working group together with her other colleagues here at CDC. And she'll be presenting data about cocooning and Tdap vaccination. And then Lucy Breakwell uh, will give us some uh, presentation about uh, acellular pertussis vaccine effectiveness uh, with regard to protect and deficient uh, board of telepertussis. So, Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rengold. And as uh, Dr. Liang is coming on up, just the uh, comment by uh, Dr. Benjamin, Robert Benjamin from Marin County Public Health Department in uh, California. Uh, just asked if pertussis elimination control is a national priority, will the government incentivize the development of a new, more immunogenic vaccine? So just so the work group has that information before them as they move forward. Thank you, Dr. Tempty. 
So uh, as Dr. Rangel just noted, ACIP did make considerations for a second dose of Tdap for the general population and healthcare personnel, but did not change the current recommendations. The work group has since considered Tdap vaccination of close contacts of infants and evaluated the need for and potential benefit and impact of additional doses. So for today's discussion, I will present a summary of these data and the work group's conclusions. So the following slides were presented to ACIP in October 2014 when reviewing considerations for healthcare personnel. And as a reminder, currently both Tdap vaccines are licensed only for single dose. So second dose of Tdap is safe and immunogenic. There are several published clinical trials from other countries on a second dose of Tdap at five or 10 years after the first dose. Reported adverse events were generally comparable to those after the first Tdap. The majority of local and systemic adverse events were mild to moderate and self-limited. Of few serious adverse events reported, none were determined to be related to receipt of the second Tdap, and safety profiles were comparable at the five and 10-year interval. For immunogenicity after a second Tdap, tetanus and diphtheria sewer protection were close to 100%. For pertussis vaccine components, responses are similar at the five and 10-year intervals and responses are also comparable to historic and contemporaneous first dose. In the United States, both pharmaceutical companies are conducting clinical trials of a second dose of Tdap. Sanofi Pasteur's US study for a second dose of Adacel is complete and was presented to ACIP in 2013. A, revaccin uh, a revaccination study in Canada will finish later this year and Sanofi plans to submit to FDA consideration for label updates. GSK is conducting revaccination clinical studies with Boostrix. One study is complete and the other began this year. GSK plans to submit data to FDA for consideration of label updates will depend on pertussis epidemiology and ACIP recommendations. With regards to Tdap vaccine effectiveness, previous estimates ranging between 66% to 78%. However, these studies involved adolescents who had received some whole cell vaccines as part of their childhood series. At the time, the effectiveness of Tdap among adolescents who had only received acellular vaccines in childhood was unknown. In 2012, in collaboration with Washington State Department of Health, CDC conducted a large-scale study in adolescents who only received acellular pertussis vaccines as part of their childhood series. Estimated Tdap vaccine effectiveness was 65% and is consistent with previous studies. This study also looked at the duration of protection. In 2012, Wisconsin also evaluated Tdap vaccine effectiveness and duration of protection in their adolescent population that only received acellular vaccines. Despite the different methodologies, both studies showed Tdap to be effective but that effectiveness decreases with increasing time since receipt. For indirect protection, it is unclear what the effect of Tdap vaccination is on preventing pertussis transmission. For people vaccinated with acellular pertussis vaccines, symptoms are not as severe and presumably less likely to transmit. An Australian cocooning evaluation found a modest decrease in the risk of pertussis in infants whose parents were vaccinated at a sufficient time to booster their immune response relative to the infant pertussis incubation period. This effect was also seen in infants whose mothers were vaccinated postpartum, but it's unclear whether the lower risk for infants was attributable to a short-term impact on transmission for recently vaccinated mothers or lack of exposure. An animal model showed the acellular pertussis vaccinated baboons were protected against disease but not infection. Bacterial colony counts from nasal pharyngeal washes were comparable to those observed in unvaccinated animals. Infected but asymptomatic baboons transmitted pertussis to other co-housed baboons. Although these results are striking, it's unclear if this animal model represents what happens with humans, vaccines, and infection. There is currently no human challenge model. Compared with other age groups, infants less than one year of age have substantially higher rates of pertussis, as shown here, and the largest burden of pertussis-related deaths. 
Among all infant pertussis cases, infants two months of age or younger have the highest reported percent of hospitalizations and deaths. When Tdap was first recommended in 2005, ACIP recommended a dose of Tdap for close contacts of infants. This cocooning strategy would protect the vaccinated individual from pertussis and potentially provide indirect protection to the infant. Ideally, contacts would be vaccinated at least two weeks before contact with the infant, and pregnant women who had never received Tdap would be vaccinated immediately postpartum. This new strategy required a shift in thinking and a new paradigm for vaccine delivery. In 2010, the United States experienced a resurgence of pertussis. California declared an epidemic and recommended a dose of Tdap for pregnant women. During this time, ACIP recognized the difficulty to widely implement cocooning programs and considered shifting the timing of the mother's Tdap dose from postpartum to during pregnancy, which would provide earlier direct benefit to mother and potentially indirect protection to the infant, and high levels of transplacental maternal antibodies would likely provide direct immunity to infants. Therefore, in 2011, ACIP recommended Tdap during pregnancy for women who previously had not received Tdap and, not, and if not vaccinated during pregnancy, then a woman was recommended Tdap postpartum. In 2012, ACIP expanded the recommendation to every pregnancy, irrespective of the, the, the patient's prior history of receiving Tdap. The recommendation for the postpartum dose did not change and therefore limited the postpartum dose to women who had not previously received Tdap. For cocooning, guidance on additional Tdap doses for close contacts, including the postpartum dose, would be forthcoming. Successful demonstration cocooning programs have been documented. Programs have been primarily hospital-based and targeting the postpartum period. To achieve operational success, common strategies were implemented. For the postpartum dose, standing orders were in place. For close contacts, hospitals had on-site clinics with convenient hours and offering free Tdap. Despite these successes, cocooning has not been implemented at the national level. The challenges programs face are particular to vaccinating the close contacts. Logistically, programs are targeting close contacts during a short period of time, the postpartum hospital stay. This may require additional staffing for education and vaccine administration. There's the inability to verify a person's vaccine history, and not all hospitals are set up to treat outpatients and instead may refer family members elsewhere. Financially, there are operational costs to maintaining a program. Programs with free vaccine are challenged to ensure continued funding to offer free vaccine. For programs that do not offer free vaccine, the hospital faces reimbursement and billing challenges. These challenges make it difficult to sustain a program. In 2012, Tdap coverage was 26% in adults who reported living with an infant aged less than one year. But how complete is a cocoon around an infant? Published reports from cocooning programs have reported Tdap uptake highest in postpartum mothers with limited success in vaccinating fathers or other family members. Tdap uptake has been limited by the knowledge gap about pertussis and the vaccines, household size impacting the ability to vaccinate all members, and locating where to get vaccinated if no on-site clinic is available. For women who receive Tdap postpartum, the limited evidence on the effectiveness of the postpartum dose in preventing infant pertussis is conflicting. A California ecological study noted that pertussis incidence in infants born in hospitals with a postpartum Tdap policy was lower compared to hospitals without postpartum Tdap policy, suggesting that vaccinating new mothers may protect infants from pertussis. Another study compared pre-intervention to post-intervention period and found no impact of postpartum Tdap on infant disease. The evidence on the effectiveness of cocooning in preventing infant pertussis is unclear and inconclusive. We are aware of two US studies that have attempted to evaluate the impact of cocooning. A hospital-based program observed no impact in reduction of infant pertussis, 
but due to the limitations of the study, results should be interpreted with caution. An emerging infections program study set out to conduct a case control study to measure effectiveness of cocooning at preventing pertussis among infants less than two months of age. But with limited, limited numbers, the study instead, instead assessed the completeness of, cocoo, of, the, of cocooning. Among infant cases and controls, a total of 199 cocoons were identified. Among those, only nine were fully vaccinated cocoons, five of which the mother was the only cocoon member. The Australian cocooning case control study found moderate reduction in risk of pertussis in infants whose parents were vaccinated at a sufficient time to booster their immune response relative to the infant pertussis incubation period. Over the past tech decade, with the changing pertussis epidemiology, a shift in the source of pertussis transmission to infants has been observed. Previously, parents were commonly identified as a source of pertussis with mothers most identified. More recently though, siblings have been identified as the most common source. Through enhanced surveillance data over eight years in the US, among infant pertussis cases, 44% identified a source of infection. Of those, 66% to 85% were classified as family members with siblings as the most commonly identified family member. Since 2011, ACIP has recommended Tdap vaccination for women during pregnancy. Safety data continue to be reassuring for both women and newborns. In 2012, the United Kingdom recommended pertussis vaccination for pregnant women Two recent publications from the same immunization program show agreement of high effectiveness of maternal pertussis vaccination. An observational study used the vaccine screening method. For infants less than three months of age at onset of pertussis, vaccine effectiveness was 91% for infants whose mothers were vaccinated at least 28 days before birth. In contrast, effectiveness was 38% for infants whose mothers were vaccinated zero to six days before or one to 13 days after birth. The case control study looked at the effectiveness in infants less than two months of age at onset of pertussis infection. The unadjusted vaccine effectiveness was 91%, and when adjusted, the vaccine effectiveness was 93%. The UK was able to achieve high uptake of pertussis vaccination in pregnant women in a short period of time, which allowed for these evaluations. Here in the US, uptake of Tdap among pregnant women has not been as successful. Tdap coverage estimates among pregnant women ranges from 14 to 23%. After much discussion, the work group has made the following assessments regarding pertussis and vaccinating close contacts of infants with Tdap. The work group recognizes the importance of optimizing strategies for preventing pertussis in infants and that many healthcare programs have put a lot of time and effort in cocooning programs. But after 10 years, implementation and sustainability remains a challenge with barriers preventing close contacts getting vaccinated. There's a lack of data evaluating the effectiveness and impact of the strategy on preventing infant pertussis. And the evidence is inconclusive that additional doses of for close contacts, including the postpartum dose, would be beneficial in prevention of disease and transmission of pertussis to infants. Even if additional Tdap doses are recommended, this would not address the observed shift to siblings as a source of pertussis transmission to infants and puts greater emphasis on the importance of providing newborns with anti-pertussis maternal antibodies. And there is an optimal strategy in place, vaccinating women during pregnancy. At this time, the ACIP Pertussis Vaccine Workgroup concludes the available evidence does not support changes to the current ACIP Tdap recommendation for close contacts of infants, including the postpartum dose for women. If Tdap vaccines are licensed for additional doses, the ACIP will be asked to reconsider the various policy options. Until then, the focus should be on the current pertussis vaccination program, maintain high levels of DTAP coverage, sustain Tdap coverage in adolescents, improved adult coverage, and vaccinate women during pregnancy to protect infants. Before opening this up to the committee for discussion, I wanted to share the following. 
In an effort to improve Tdap coverage in pregnant women, CDC recently launched a new campaign to promote Tdap immunization during pregnancy. After conducting mixed methods formative research, new materials targeting pregnant women and prenatal healthcare professionals were developed in collaboration with co-branding partners AAFP, AAP, ACNM, and ACOG. These are samples of materials for healthcare professionals, and I know that copies were provided to the committee members. I want to point out the emphasis on not relying on postpartum immunization in this first fact sheet. And since reimbursement challenges are a perceived barrier to stocking Tdap, we highlight ACOG's reimbursement tools and create, created an entire sheet on how to make a strong referral. These are examples of the English and Spanish language tools for pregnant women. Fortunately, we learned in the focus groups that pregnant women are very receptive to getting Tdap once they learn how it can benefit the baby. A strong recommendation from their provider can make all the difference. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, Ms. Pellegrini. Thank you, great presentation. Um, in the studies looking at uh, siblings as the most common source of infection, was there any attempt to ascertain whether those siblings were themselves up to date on their pertussis vaccination? I am not familiar with the risks. They were not. Oh, not, not in that assessment, no. They weren't assessed or part of the study. Dr. Bennett. Yeah, just a follow-up question to that. Do you have any sense of the age distribution among those siblings? So among those siblings, the age range was between 1 and 19, with the median age about 8. Uh, Dr. Alt. Carol Hayes had to run out to, the, to catch a plane at the airport, but she wanted to compliment you on this material, and I would like to second that, too, so whoever's responsible for that, nice job with that. The other thing I wanted to ask you, ACOG made its recommendation for vaccination during pregnancy in the spring of 2013. Do you have any data from this year or last year about uptake of that recommendation? The most recent data that we have was from the internet panel survey, the flu internet panel survey of pregnant women, and that was for um, the 2014-2015 flu season. And for that, the coverage among women um, during that time period was about was 23 percent. So we are aware that some of those coverage do cover a period of time when we were still transitioning from one dose during for one pregnancy to every pregnancy. Dr. Plotkin. Yes, I, I'd like to see more emphasis on the timing of vaccination during pregnancy. Somewhere in one of the slides it says uh, up to 36 weeks. Now, uh, there are data, and they, they need to be confirmed, but suggesting that the optimal time for vaccination during pregnancy is between 27 and 30 weeks. So, uh, and there are the, the British data also suggest that vaccinating uh, late in pregnancy obviously uh, doesn't permit time for transplacental passage of antibodies. So I, I would suggest that there be more emphasis on timing the vaccination, not at the last moment in pregnancy, but, but earlier in the third trimester. Uh, Dr. Sir. Uh, with regard to coverage, I just want to emphasize Jennifer's point that a strong recommendation does carry to, uh, well with pregnant women, and this is illustrated by an effort in the Northern California Kaiser program where they've achieved a greater than 80 percent coverage for the last three quarters in their pregnant women. Uh, Dr. Zahn. Yeah, from a local public health standpoint, I, I guess I'd comment that uh, I think in Orange County, uh, speaking for nature, I think other local health departments have had the same experience I have, is would we have gone to local obstetricians to talk to them about it? I mean, the general uh, pushback has not been, I'm not aware of it, or and I'm not, it is vac providing the Tdap vaccine doesn't really fit into my clinical model. And so I, I certainly think that exhortation and, and reminding people is an important thing. Uh, but logistically speaking, to move that dial, I mean, the reason that we do well at Kaiser is because Kaiser has a place where they can go to get vaccinated. And I think the hesitancy for many people is you can exhort them to get vaccinated, but if they don't know or feel like they have a place to go, ideally be the obstetrician, 
pharmacies aren't actually a good option either because of insurance barriers and issues. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm, as a local level, I'd love to know which direction to go forward here, but I think we need a little more than posters, need some clarity on exactly where we can, you know, consistently get them vaccinated. Dr. Herman. Thanks. Just to reiterate what Matt said and, and Mark said, I mean, what we've found is that it, it's not, I mean, the strong recommendation is great, but it's having the vaccine on site, having it right there so that women can be vaccinated right at that time. Because even if there's no barriers with insurance at a pharmacy, it's, it's getting to the pharmacy. And we know from influenza and many studies that anything that, you know, you have to work a little bit harder to do, life gets in the way and it just doesn't happen. So the barriers, at least that have been identified in the ACOG study and others for prenatal care providers not offering on site is either real or perceived financial barriers. You know, setting up a program and either real or perceived feeling they're not getting reimbursed adequately. So I don't know how much of that is true, but that's kind of where we need to go. And Kaiser has it right there. Um, apparently there's even drop off if you have to go to another building. So it's very important that on site. And we are going to, to look at our Medi-Cal data. Um, there's a half a million births a year in California. 50% of those are on Medi-Cal. And we'll look at what our uptake is in Medi-Cal. That will give us a, a pretty good idea of what's happening. And we should be doing that soon. Following up on that point, I'm curious whether or not there's any data looking at uh, family practices that do OB care versus uh, uh, obstetrical practices because all of our practices usually have the full contingent of pediatric and adult, uh, including Tdap. And b based on my sample size in my clinic, we do really, really well with Tdap in pregnancy. We're probably 80 to 90 percent of, of pregnancies receive it, but we do have things on hand. Dr. Baker. Uh, a comment on, on Dr. Plotman's statement. Uh, through CDC funding, one of my colleagues is um, actually the samples are being run, so we will have data, very precise, uh, modern data with this, these vaccines of the timing by week in gestation and the amount of antibody transfer. Um, another study will look because the perception is at 32 to 34 weeks, you don't get any antibody across. Well, it depends on how much you have because there's passive transport and you begin active transport. So I think in the next year, we'll have more data about timing that could uh, do something. But I uh, work in a hospital. Our pediatric department runs the obstetric service but with obstetricians, let me be clear. And, the, and so what we have is a group of academic practice people and a group of private practice people who have offices in the same building with the same pharmacy, so there is no barrier of access. Va vaccine is there. And there's tremendous disparity because the, the Baylor academic group has the best practices that they've initiated, so it's part of the uh, EMR. And, and there's a tremendous disparity. So I, it, Dr. Herman, I agree, have it there, but you do have to have the recommendation of the practitioner and both groups have been educated. Uh, Dr. Riley. So I have a question about um, sort of ongoing um, surveillance in terms of, um, you know, who's of uptake, because I think most of us are in institutions where, um, like California, ours is 89% and it has been that way for a long time. And so every time I see these numbers of 22%, I mean, I just want to scream. But so where do we get the data and are we going to have that data as we go forward? So of the various sources of data for CDC to collect coverage among pregnant women, one is through the internet, the flu internet panel survey of pregnant women, which is seasonal for each flu season. The other one is through PRAMS. There is a module um, where they do ask about Tdap uptake or Tdap coverage among pregnant women. Um, but from my current understanding, that that is a, um, an option, optional module. It's not required by all all states to answer or choose that, those set of questions to answer. And the last I was aware of, it was at least 13 states that had been, had picked up that Tdap coverage module and asked, um, 
ask, ask, ask those questions. Can we request that it be mandatory that they give us that information? I think you would have to ask somebody else. <laughs> okay. I see Dr. Zahn's hand up. I see Dr. Lett, and I think we need to move on to the next topic after you two. Uh, so go ahead. Yeah, just, just another comment about, about pertussis. From a local public health standpoint, I think an awful lot, we are seeing far more pertussis. We're seeing bigger waves when you have disease, but even when the waves go away, we're still seeing a lot of disease. And more and more local public health is emphasizing identifying high-risk scenarios, i.e. infants. So an awful lot of patients who have pertussis, we call them and say, is there an infant in the household? If yes, we pursue it. And what, we, what my nurses in public health always ask me is this, okay, I have a 28-year-old dad, guy, has a two-month-old infant, 28-year-old dad, was supposed to get vaccinated when he was 23, he got that Tdap. Now we know from everything we can see that the immunization, the immunity goes away. Now every adult's supposed to be getting that Tdap coverage, everybody's supposed to be getting it, but now we have an adult who we think by all the science we have is non-immune and he's now right next to a two-month-old, and why would we not vaccinate that person? And I don't know if the question is to the cocooning question or the question is whether we should be exhorting people to improve adult Tdap coverage if we're not you know, doing the, you know, the repeat vaccination. But there's a logical quandary, I think, that providers and nurses ask me about all the time. And Dr. Lett. Um, this is just a, a final um, comment. And that I don't know, I really don't understand how the PRAMS survey is totally um, operated and funded, but I would also make a plea to have it be part of the core questions, because I, I learned sort of by chance that it was being dropped, and I, I had to submit a brief um, to get it included, and I, and I had to do a presentation, and I had to come up, and then, and then they had to approve that, a board within our state, and then I had to provide the funding from my program to keep the question in and, and almost um, got lost. And so I don't exactly know how it happens, but if at CDC this could be part of the core um, CDC funded questions. Uh, thank you. If we can have uh, Dr. Uh, Breakwell come on up. Good afternoon. Despite high vaccination coverage, there has been a resurgence of pertussis disease in the United States, with notable peaks in 2005, 2010, and 2012. In recent years, reported pertussis has significantly increased and remains elevated compared with previous decades. There are several factors that which could be contributing to the resurgence in pertussis disease. Surveillance bias is one possible explanation. Increased provider and public awareness and improved sensitivity of diagnostic tests, such as PCR, can lead to increased identification and reporting of pertussis disease. Waning immunity may play a role as it could increase susceptibility in individuals as time since their last vaccination increases. Recent investigations have shown that vaccine effectiveness, VE, wanes among children vaccinated solely with acellular vaccines. In a case control study conducted in California, VE of DTaP among children was 89%. Although VE was excellent within one year of receiving the fifth DTaP dose, 98%, protection waned to 71% by five years post-vaccination. This result is consistent with other published studies. Waning with protection was also observed with Tdap. In Washington and Wisconsin, VE of Tdap, estimated by two different methodologies, was 73% to 75% within one year of Tdap vaccination, but waned to 34% by two years post-vaccination. A further contributing factor to the resurgence could be genetic changes in the Bordetella pertussis bacteria. One such example is the recent emergence of protactin-deficient pertussis strains. Protactin may be involved in bacterial adhesion to respiratory tract epithelial cells and in resistance to neutrophil-mediated clearance. It is also a component of all of the acellular vaccines in use in the United States. Protactin-deficient strains have been identified in Australia, Finland, France, and Japan. In light of this, 
our branch evaluated CDC pertussis isolate collection to determine when protectin deficient strains emerged in the United States and their current national prevalence. A protectin deficient strain was first identified in 1994, but not again until 2010, when 14% of isolates lacked protectin. By 2012, 85% of tested isolates were protectin deficient, and currently around 80% of tested isolates are protectin deficient. Protectin deficiency does not appear to alter clinical symptoms, but may provide a selective advantage, as fully vaccinated cases were four times more likely to have protectin deficient pertussis compared to unvaccinated cases. The impact of protectin deficiency on VE is unknown. Here we report the first evaluation of pertussis VE among protectin deficient pertussis strains. Our objectives were to estimate VE and duration of protection of the five-dose DTAP series among four to 10-year-olds and Tdap among 11 to 19-year-olds, and also to determine VE for both vaccines among laboratory-confirmed protactin-deficient pertussis strains. Vermont was an ideal place to conduct the evaluation as it had the second highest pertussis incidence rate in 2012. Its state laboratory cultures all pertussis specimens it receives, which is a necessary step to determine protactin status. And it had a very high proportion of protactin deficiency among its tested isolates from 2012 at 95%. We conducted two matched case control studies in Vermont. Cases included all probable and confirmed pertussis cases reported during 2011 to 2013, aged 4 to 10 years for the DTAP evaluation and 11 to 19 years for the TDAP evaluation. Controls were randomly selected from the same age groups from the primary care home of the case in a 3 to 1 ratio. Cases and controls were matched on primary care home and additionally birthier for the TDAP analysis. Demographics and pertussis vaccination history were collected for all cases and controls from the medical chart. If necessary, vaccination history was further supplemented by parent interview. Conditional logistic regression was used to calculate odds ratios, accounting for matching factors. VE was calculated by 1 minus the odds ratio multiplied by 100%. Cases were classified according to Vermont Department of Health definitions, based on those of the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Persons meeting the clinical case definition were considered probable cases. Confirmed cases were culture positive, or met the clinical case definition and had a positive PCR test, or met the clinical case definition and were epi-linked to a lab-confirmed case. Protactin deficient strains were pertussis culture positive and confirmed to be protactin deficient through molecular testing for specific mutations and ELISA for protein expression. Vaccination status was confirmed by review of medical charts or by parent interview. For a participant to be considered vaccinated with the five-dose DTAP series, Doses one to three were received at less than one year of age, dose four at one to less than two years of age, and dose five at four to less than seven years of age. For Tdap, a dose was received at or after 11 years of age. Unvaccinated participants were defined as having no pertussis containing vaccines in their medical chart and had parental confirmation of non-receipt. Whilst I present the um, results to you, I'd just like you to bear in mind that these are preliminary data. Overall, 850 cases aged 4 to 19 years were reported to the Vermont Department of Health during 2011 to 2013. Of these, 73% were reported during 2012. Cases came from all 12 public health districts and 91 primary care homes. Data was collected for 820 cases, or 96% of reported cases. 30 cases were excluded because their primary care home was based outside of Vermont, it declined to participate, or we were unable to assign them to a primary care home. First, I'll discuss the five-dose DTAP series. Data was collected on 382 cases and 1,113 controls aged 4 to 10 years. Overall, 31% of cases and 35% of controls were excluded, predominantly for having unverified vaccination history, having received less than five DTAP doses or five DTAP doses off schedule. 
Overall, 263 cases and 726 controls were included in the analysis. 71% of cases were confirmed, of which 83% were lab confirmed, and 17% epilinked, and 29% were probable. Cases and controls had similar demographics, including sex, ethnicity, race, vaccines for children program eligibility, and insurance status. Controls, shown in blue, were selected from across the entire age range due to the matching criteria. Cases, shown in yellow, were more likely to be older and unvaccinated. 93% of cases were vaccinated compared to 99% of controls. VE of the five-dose DTAP series was estimated at 84%, with 95% confidence intervals ranging between 58% and 94%. We found over time that protection waned. During the first year after receipt of the fifth dose of DTAP, VE was 90%. By five to seven years post-vaccination, VE had fallen to 68%, a reduction of 22%. This result is consistent with the other studies mentioned earlier. Moving on to the TDAP evaluation. Data was collected on 438 cases and 1,256 controls aged 11 to 19 years. Overall, 15% of cases and 13% of controls were excluded, predominantly for having unverified vaccination history or for having received Tdap before they were 11 years old. Overall, 372 cases and 1,090 controls were included. 80% of cases were confirmed, of which 90% were lab confirmed and 10% were epilinked, and 20% were probable. Again, cases and controls had similar demographics, including sex, ethnicity, race, insurance status, and vaccines for children program eligibility. As a consequence of the matching criteria, similar numbers of cases and controls were included for each age year, as shown in the figure. Cases were more likely to be unvaccinated. 70% of cases were vaccinated compared to 84% of controls. To align our findings with current vaccination recommendations, the Tdap VE analysis was restricted to participants that had only received acellular vaccines. Vermont has been a universal purchaser of vaccines since 1993, and following review of vaccine distribution data provided by the Vermont Department of Health, we assumed whole cell vaccines were no longer available after 1997. Therefore, this analysis only included participants born after 1997, which would encompass all participants aged 11 to 12 years, shown in the red box with the solid line, and most participants aged 13 to 15 years, shown in the red box with the dashed line. Participants that had only received acellular vaccines included 244 cases and 714 controls. TDAP VE was estimated at 70%, with 95% confidence intervals ranging between 54% and 81%. As with the DTAP vaccine series, duration of protection waned with time. During the first year after receipt of TDAP, VE was 76%. By two to four years post-vaccination, VE had fallen to 56%, a reduction of 20%. And again, this result was consistent with the other studies mentioned earlier. Lastly, I'll discuss pertussis VE among protactin deficient strains. Protactin status can only be determined with culture isolates. Of cases included in the DTAP evaluation, 59% were lab confirmed by PCR or culture, while 75% were lab confirmed for the TDAP evaluation. Of those DTAP cases that were lab confirmed, 61% were pertussis culture positive, and of these, 90% were tested for protactin deficiency. Of these, 98% were protactin deficient. Of those Tdap cases that were lab confirmed, 65% were pertussis culture positive, and of these, 92% were tested for protactin deficiency. Of those tested, 95% were protactin deficient. Only a limited number of cases from the DTAP VE analysis were protactin deficient and met the definition of unvaccinated, preventing us from estimating VE among protactin deficient strains. We were able to evaluate Tdap VE among protactin deficient strains. Overall, VE was estimated at 51%, with 95% confidence intervals ranging between 5% and 75%. 
these intervals overlapped with those of previous studies. In conclusion, we show that for both vaccines, initial VE is high, but that protection wanes over time. Our findings are consistent with previous VE estimates. Among protactin deficient strains, we found that Tdap VE was lower, but confidence intervals overlapped with the overall VE estimate. This implies that VE among protactin deficient pertussis is similar to previous studies, regardless of the prevalence of protactin deficiency. For example, during the 2010 California outbreak and the 2012 Washington State outbreak, the proportions of protactin deficient strains were estimated to be 14% and 76% respectively. Our VE estimates are comparable to these two studies, strongly suggesting that protactin deficiency does not impact VE for reported pertussis disease. Case control study designs are commonly susceptible to selection and information bias. To mitigate this, cases and controls were matched on primary care home to ensure exposure to similar, similar circulating pertussis strains and to limit for provider-associated diagnostic and reporting biases. Another limitation in this evaluation was the low proportion of unvaccinated participants with confirmed protactin status. Since protactin confirmation was only completed on 40% of cases, the tested isolates may not be representative of all circulating pertussis strains. In addition, if there is a selective advantage to protactin deficiency, we may expect more protactin expressing strains among unvaccinated cases. By including these cases in the analysis, we may have overestimated our vaccine effectiveness. Finally, our VE estimates are also unlikely to account for mild disease, which may be more prominent among vaccinated individuals and less likely to be reported. These evaluations suggest that the lack of protecting among currently circulating strains of pertussis does not substantially impact VE for reported pertussis disease. However, our evaluations did not capture mild or asymptomatic cases and was not able to investigate the impact of protectin deficiency on transmission. Given that protectin deficiency may potentially provide a selective advantage, further investigations are required to better define the role of protectin in pathogenesis and transmission. And that just leaves me to thank all the people who helped make this evaluation possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very clear uh, presentation. Uh, out of fairness to our disaster group and with acknowledgement that a number of our members have really flights, uh, just if there are one or two uh, quick uh, questions here or comments, we can add Dr. Rengold. Uh, well, just in reference to Dr. Benjamin's question about incentivizing the, the, the uh, development of better pertussis vaccines, uh, the, the working group has attempted to, to ascertain what types of pertussis vaccines might be under development. The news is not encouraging, at least as far as I can ascertain. So um, I don't see any better vaccines being available in the next few years. So if, I think Dr. Benjamin's point is very well taken. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? Thank you so very much. And if we can have uh, Dr. Belongi come on up to the uh, podium and introduce the herpes zoster topic. Thank you, I'll be very brief with the introduction. Uh, in 2006, uh, FDA licensed a live attenuated zoster vaccine. Uh, in 2008, the ACIP recommended routine use of this vaccine for all persons over age 60 who have no contraindications. In 2011, the FDA uh, approved uh, the vaccine for shingles prevention in people 50 to 59 years old. Uh, however, the ACIP did not uh, make any changes to the age recommendations. Uh, and since then, there have been some new developments. Let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, GSK has an investigational vaccine, uh, a subunit uh, adjuvanted vaccine for preventing zoster in healthy adults uh, greater than or equal to 50 years old. Uh, Merck has an investigational vaccine for zoster prevention in immunocompromised individuals. And the same GSK vaccine is also being evaluated for prevention of zoster in immunocompromised individuals. So the work group had been inactive for a period of time, and I, I, I just joined um, last year when I became a new ACIP member. Um, we've added new members with clinical expertise and immunocompromised patients, um, reviewed the history of the work group activities and recommendations, 
and have been receiving a series of presentations by the manufacturers on herpes zoster activities and the status of the vaccines that are in development. Uh, we have a large and highly talented work group, and I want to thank uh, all the members, um, and particularly uh, Rafael Harpaz, uh, who is our CDC liaison for um, expert leadership and, and helping me get up to speed um, on this topic. Uh, so we're going to have two presentations today. One is an update on herpes zoster epidemiology and vaccine coverage um, by Dr. Harpaz, and then uh, a review of the results of the phase three efficacy study of the adjuvanted zoster subunit vaccine by Dr. Heinemann from GSK. Uh, thank you. Okay, hello. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ed. And as Ed mentioned, this is a great up, uh, opportunity for me to update the um, ACIP about Zoster. You haven't heard about it for a while, and it's um, also going to help frame the next presentation. So um, in the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to briefly discuss the clinical manifestations of Zoster. I'll talk about its epidemiology, talk about Zoster vaccine a bit, something about re uh, more recent policy developments, and then I'll, final, uh, I'll complete it with um, some discussion about Zoster vaccine uptake. So regarding clinical, the clinical picture, Zoster manifests as a painful unilateral rash. The rash generally affects one to three dermato adjacent dermatomes. It develops over five to seven days, and it uh, generally resolves um, by 25 days. While the rash can sometimes cause um, secondary infections and scarring, and the VZV from the rash can infect um, susceptible children to cause uh, chicken pox, the primary acute problem associated with zoster is pain, which can be excruciating at times. About 90% of patients um, will experience pain or some kind of distressing sensation. Um, and in fact, these symptoms often, uh, often will precede the um, onset of rash by four or five days, um, which can lead to, or, or sometimes even longer, which can lead to um, diagnostic dilemmas and diagnostic workups for various conditions like um, you know, cardiac or abdominal etiologies, which itself can lead to patient distress. And um, the most distressing complication of zoster is, of course, um, post-herpetic neuralgia, or PHN. This is the prolonged, sometimes incapacitating pain that can, uh, continues after the resolution of the rash. While definitions regarding duration vary, PHN lasts for months or even years. And while prompt use of antivirals can relieve the chronic pain of zoster, but treatment is at best only partially effective at preventing PHN itself. Furthermore, while there are guidelines for the treatment of PHN itself, these treatments, too, are only partially effective um, and with inconsistent benefit. In addition, PHN treatments often typically involve psychotropic medications like tricyclic antidepressants, anti-seizure medications, opioids, um, and these are often the source of severe side effects, and they are particularly hard to tolerate by the elderly who get PHN. The underlying pathophysiology of PHN is not known, just like it's not known for herpes zoster. And while, PH, while PHN is clearly contingent on zoster, but the pathways, the pathophysiologic pathways that lead to these two conditions, um, we don't know to what extent they are distinct. Um, another common and important complication of zoster is herpes zoster ophthalmicus, which occurs with involvement of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Um, herpes uh, HZO can lead to chronic ocular complications, reduced vision, or even to unilateral blindness. So moving on to the epidemiology of zoster, it's difficult to discuss it without first talking about risk factors. And the two risk factors that are most important are, are age, which is the dominant risk factor driving the incidence and burden of zoster in any population, and immunosuppression. So see, for instance, the, um, the graph on the left, which shows data from market scan administrative data sets for 2000, 2001. The incidence of zoster is on the y-axis and uh, per 1,000 person years. Age is on the x-axis. And you can see how the incidence of zoster starts to really accelerate after the age of about 50. And similar data has been reported for virtually every study that has been done on zoster epidemiology, regardless of the methods. But not only is age the dominant risk factor for zoster, it's also the primary determinant for the severity of that zoster. So see the graph on the right with population-based data from 
Yan in Olmsted County, Minnesota. The incidence of PHN is in cases per thousand person years on the y-axis and ages on the x-axis starting at 50 to 59. And you can see how the, um, that accelerates even much faster than zoster being about 10 times, the risk of PHN being about 10 times higher in persons um, 80 and older compared to those 50 to 59. Um, in fact, for every 1,000 persons with zoster, um, most severe outcomes increase dramatically with age, especially hospitalization. And note, too, that the oldest old are the very ones that have the hardest time tolerating uh, PHN and have the most difficulty tolerating the, medic the treatments for PHN. As I mentioned, the other risk factor is immunosuppression. While this is less common in the population, it remains quite influential because of the magnitude of the risk, uh, the associated risk. So for instance, in, um, um, the risk is increased 50-fold in persons with hematologic malignancies, stem cell transplantation, or HIV infection. Um, and in addition, those who are, who are immunocompromised who experience zoster are the ones who are at the greatest risk for developing um, serious and life-threatening or site-threatening site complications. So moving on to, uh, with that background on risk factors, the annual rate of zoster in the United States is about four per thousand per year. Um, that translates to over a million cases per year, and the lifetime risk for developing zoster is approximately 30%. And while age and immunosuppression explain a large portion of those cases, of those 30%. We cannot explain what distinguishes most of the 30% of persons who develop zoster during life with the 70% who do not. Um, finally, I want to mention that the age-adjusted rates for zoster appear to be increasing over calendar time. Let's look at that on the next slide. So um, the graph shows age stratified Medicare data on zoster incidence amongst persons 65 and older on the y-axis and calendar time from 1992 to 2006 on the x-axis. Rates have been increasing substantially over time for all age groups. This pattern has also been observed in other data from the United States dating back as far as 1945. And, um, and it's also been seen in Canada and in East Asia and uh, elsewhere. We do not have any cohesive explanation for this calendar effect, for this uh, increase over time. So now moving on to the Zoster vaccine, um, or Zostavax. Zostavax was licensed in 2006 based on the shingles prevention study, or the SPS. That trial involved over 38,000 healthy adults, 60 and older. Um, they were followed for about three years. Subjects were randomized to receive the placebo, a placebo or to receive the attenuated oak strain of EZV, found also in the Varivax or the varicella vaccine, but the titer is 14 times higher or more. Um, vaccine efficacy was found 51% again for prevention of, zos of, of zoster and 67% for prevention of post-herpetic neuralgia. There were no adverse events attributed to the vaccine. The local reactions were Based on these results, the ACIP recommended routine vaccination of adults 60 and older with a single dose of Zostavax. Um, the results of the shingles prevention study have been, um, have been supported by observational studies since that time. So here are results of the SPS focusing on vaccine efficacy as a function of age. Um, the y-axis shows the vaccine efficacy. The x-axis shows different age groups with the left-hand panel showing summary data for all ages. The red corresponds to PHN and the orange to zoster. So I'll highlight two findings. First note that the VE for uh, the vaccine efficacy for um, zoster declines dramatically down to 18% in persons 80 and older. Um, and second, not only is P the vaccine efficacy for PHN generally better, but it's, um, but it's also better preserved as a function of age with a vaccine efficacy of 39% in persons 80 and older. Um, this graph shows shingles prevention study data on vaccine efficacy at preventing PHN um, using different definitions for PHN and a progressively longer duration of pain. The y-axis shows the vaccine efficacy and the x-axis shows the definition of PHN and duration of pain. Um, note that the vaccine works progressively better at averting the most prolonged episodes of PHN, and it's those longest episodes, sometimes lasting for years, that are the real, the most critical targets for the vaccine for, for prevention. Um, 
More recent developments. Uh, so there have been several more recent developments with policy implications in the zoster arena. The first was a large multinational study that was conducted clinical trial of Zostavax in persons 50 to 59. Follow-up lasted just about a year. Vaccine um, had the vaccine efficacy in that population was 70 percent. And based on the results and the associated reassuring safety data, um, the FDA issued a license for adults 50 to 59 in addition to the ongoing license for 60 and older. Also subjects from the original SPS trial of adults who had been then 60 years of age and older were enrolled into a longer follow-up study that extended out about 11 years following vaccination. There was no concurrent um, control group in this study because the controls following SPS were all offered Zostavax after that study was completed. So the long-term follow-up study was unblinded and was less powered than the SPS. And finally, they had to rely on historic controls to define protection. And given the rapidly changing um, Zoster incidents over time that I alluded to two slides ago, um, it was hard to draw real clear conclusions about the waning of protection from that study. There are other studies going on now, observational studies, to address that further. In another development, a clinical trial was conducted to compare the safety and immunogenicity of a second dose of Zostavax administered to patients, to adults, 10 years after they received the first dose, as compared to the immunogenicity in persons who just received a first dose of the vaccine. Again, these were age matched, and the immunogenicity outcome in the two arms were um, comparable. Um, however, these immunogenicity outcomes do not um, protect, do, do not predict protection sufficiently well to draw very, uh, many, to answer many questions. So, with these developments, the ACIP rec uh, the, um, on October uh, in October 2013, the ACIP reviewed the Zostavax recommendations and left them unchanged, i.e., a routine recommendation for one dose of Zostavax in adults 60 and older. This was essentially an example of programmatic conservatism. On the one hand, given the uncertainty about waning, a change in the recommendation to vaccinate adults age 50 might leave them unprotected decades later when, they, when the burden of PHN was the greatest. Um, but on the other hand, the, the uh, degree of added protection conferred by a second dose of the Zoster vaccine was un, is unknown regardless of the associated um, program costs and complexities. So in the absence of adequate evidence on these key issues, it was felt that major changes to the Zostavax program could not be justified, whether to lower the age of vaccination to 50 or to add a revaccination recommendation. So now I'm going to say a few words about Zoster vaccine uptake. This figure shows national data on Zoster vaccine uptake amongst adults 60 and older. Rates increased from about 1.9% in 2007, a year after licensure, to 24% in 2013. The more recent data from Merck on doses delivered suggests a substantial jump in, during 2014 to approximately 30%. Um, our national data do suggest, however, that even with these with modest levels of uptake, that racial and ethnic disparities have been developing. So why has uptake been sluggish? Um, there are many reasons that we could cite. First, there's price. At a catalog price of $200, Ostavax is the most expensive adult vaccine on a per-dose basis. Not only does this make the vaccine less cost-effective on a societal level, but it results in high upfront inventory costs for providers, placing them at financial risk. Second, there's a storage and handling issue. In the United States, at least, Ostavax must be stored frozen. It's the only freezer requiring vaccine for adults. Many adult providers are not equipped to handle frozen vaccine, and in the context of inventory prices, um, the possibility of freezer failures and so on and so forth uh, may f make the provider feel that they are further at risk with their uh, financial risk. Merck does have uh, a program to share that risk, but um, pr it's not clear that providers are aware of that program. Um, next, between 2007 and 2011, there were repeated supply shortages due to challenges of manufacturing this extraordinarily finicky, live attenuated vaccine. Merck has done an outstanding job in adding manufacturing capacity over the last couple of years, and the problem now seems fully resolved. However, during that interval, a lot of time was lost since there was little promotion of the vaccine. And furthermore, during that time, it's likely that physicians and patients um, became frustrated and lost interest in the vaccine. 
Um, next, there are barriers imposed by Medicare Part D. Um, in contrast to commercial health insurers who are obligated by provisions of the Affordable Care Act to cover Zostavax without any cost sharing to the patient, Medicare Part D coverage of Zostavax is paradoxically um, involves large upfront costs by patients, um, often in the range of $100. In fact, some patients have to pay the entire cost up front only to be reimbursed weeks after filing. Um, the program is also administratively complex for physicians, though it is fairly seamless for pharmacies. And I'm going to take a very quick detour to talk about pharmacies. The ACAP has heard a number of presentations over the past couple of years on the growing role of pharmacies as vaccination sites. This is a relatively recent development affecting all vaccines, but it's been particularly important for Zostavax because a large por and a large portion of all Zosta vaccine is delivered in pharmacies. Um, however, this development does mean that, that, that there need to be systems in place for monitoring adult vaccines in pharmacies. So back to vac uh, Zostavax uptake. Um, it's, of course, affected by the same barriers that affect all adult vaccines and, for that matter, adult prevention measures in general. Um, this is not a forum to really inventory all of those, but um, in general, they include um, the fact that adult providers need to, need to juggle um, chronic disease management, acute care needs, administrative burden, and it just leaves them with less time for prevention. Um, and furthermore, adult providers have less of a, a prevention mindset when it comes to seniors. And finally, um, in, there is a general fragmentation of health care for the senior, making, it, uh, make, making accountability for prevention challenging. So that concludes my presentation. And now I'd like to have um, uh, Dr. Tom Heineman come up to the podium, and we'll answer questions after the, um, after the session. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to present GSK's adjuvanted uh, subunit herpes zoster vaccine program. And I'm presenting this, I must say, on behalf of the many people at GSK who've worked on this program for many years, and it also on behalf of the many external partners and, of course, on the thousands of individuals worldwide who volunteered for the clinical trials that we've conducted as part of this program. So from the beginning, uh, GSK conceived its Zoster vaccine program to target two particular high-risk populations, with the, which uh, Dr. Harp has already described, namely older adults, which we define as people 50 years and above, and, immuno and immunocompromised adults. So with that in mind, the candidate vaccine, which we call HZSU, which stands for herpes zoster subunit, was specifically designed to elicit strong cellular and humoral immune responses in these two target populations in which one might uh, reasonably expect uh, would, you know, that it may be somewhat resistant to uh, uh, immunologically to vaccination. So the vaccine is a adjuvanted subunit vaccine. It contains, of course, a vaccine antigen, which is uh, the purpose of which is to target the immune responses of the vaccine to the pathogen, namely varicella zoster virus in this case, and the target and the antigen that's contained in the vaccine is varicella zoster virus glycoprotein E, which was selected for a number of reasons, but most particularly because it's abundantly expressed in the virion envelope and in, of, um, of the VZV virus and also in the membranes of VZV infected cells. And uh, perhaps more importantly, it's a prominent target for VZV specific cellular and humoral immune responses. So in addition to uh, uh, a, uh, vac uh, a vaccine that's specific for VZV, of course, you need a vaccine that, is, that stimulates a, uh, an immune response of sufficient magnitude uh, to enhance the likelihood of protection. And with that in mind, the, ad the antigen was combined with one of GSK's proprietary adjuvant systems. In this case, we selected the adjuvant system 01B, or as we call it, just AS01B. This is a... Um, liposomal-based adjuvant system that contains two immunostimulants, uh, MPL or monophosphorolipid A, and QS21, which is a naturally occurring saponin, which GSK licenses from Antigenics, which is a subsidiary of the genus. At any rate, this adjuvant is designed specifically to enhance both cellular and humoral immune responses when combined with subunit antigens like GE, and we showed in a series of um, preclinical studies in small animals that when GE is combined with this adjuvant, it does in fact elicit strong uh, CD4 T cell and humoral immune responses. 
So subsequent to the completion of the preclinical uh, program, we of course moved on to phase one and two clinical trials, and we've done quite a number of these. They've all been published. I'm just gonna highlight a few of the key um, conclusions, immunologic conclusions in particular from these studies. So first, we showed that two doses of this vaccine administered at a, at a schedule of zero and two months or two months apart induced robust GE-specific CD4 T-cell and tumoral immune responses in adults 50 years and older. We further showed that these immune responses were well-preserved in people at the upper end of the age range. So in people 70 years and older at the time of vaccination, these immune responses were, were well-preserved. Uh, in older adults, these immune responses to the HCSU vaccine uh, persisted uh, well over time and, and uh, remained well above baseline at six years following the vaccination course. And we also did a couple phase one studies in immunocompromised populations, in particular autologous stem cell transplant recipients and in uh, HIV infected adults, and showed that two doses of the HZSU vaccine induced immune responses in those populations comparable to those seen in the older adults. So I'm not showing a lot of data, but I just wanted to show the uh, data on the, in the figure on the right-hand side of the slide because I think it's particularly informative. So what this is, is a, this, this uh, graph follows a cohort of older adults who are immunized with the, with the HCSU vaccine over time. And so what you see is that at month three, which is one month after the second dose of vaccine, the immune response, and this is a cellular immune response in this case, the immune response to the, uh, to the vaccine peaks at about 19 fold over the baseline level, keeping in mind that all the subjects are VZV zero positive to begin with, okay? Uh, the, the immune responses, the cellular immune responses in this case, decline over time, as one might expect, but they begin to plateau after, after a couple years. And you can see that at month 72 or six years after the original vaccination, they still remain about fourfold over the baseline levels. Okay, so with those uh, phase one and two data in hand, we move forward to the uh, uh, phase three uh, efficacy uh, uh, part of the program. And the highlight of, those pro of that part of the program are three pivotal efficacy studies, two of which are being conducted in older adults. Those are the so-called ZOE50 and ZOE70 study Zoe just answers zoster efficacy. And so the Zoe 50 study is an efficacy study being conducted in adults 50 years of age and above. And the Zoe 70 is a study being conducted in adults 70 years and above. These studies have uh, virtually identical designs except for the age of the subjects enrolled. Okay, in addition to those two older adult efficacy studies, we're also conducting the so-called zoster 002 study, which is a true efficacy study in adult autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant recipients. Okay, um, so I just want to remind you today that I will be presenting the efficacy and safety results of the ZOE 50 study in a couple minutes. But before I do that, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of some of the other studies that we're conducting in support of the efficacy studies as part of the program. I'm not gonna go through these in any detail, but I just will mention that we are doing three studies uh, to look at co-immunization of the HCSU vaccine with other vaccines used in older adults, in this case, quadrivalent flu vaccine, PPV23 pneumococcal vaccine, and Tdap. We're also doing some other supportive studies, such as lot-to-lot -lot consistency studies, schedule comparison studies, safety and immunogenicity in people who previously had zoster, uh, safety and immunogenicity in people who previously received zoster vax, and then some very interesting studies, I believe, in other immunocompromised populations. These are safety and immunogenicity studies in people who've received solid organ, excuse me, who had solid organ malignancies, uh, hemat hematologic malignancies, or who have had a recent renal transplant. Okay, so on to the ZOE 50 study. So keep in mind, this is a uh, efficacy study being conducted in people 50 years of age and above, when the primary objective is to evaluate vaccine efficacy in reducing the risk of herpes zoster in this population. Okay, there are a variety of secondary objectives. The ones I can talk about today that have been analyzed are the vaccine efficacy in the uh, different age strata that were enrolled as part of the study. So these, so the enrollees in the study were stratified into three groups, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, or 70 and above. And we have efficacy data for each of those age strata. And of course, the safety and immunogenicity, I mean, safety and reactogenicity of the vaccine. Now, there's a bunch of other very important, very interesting secondary objectives uh, 
that are part of this study, um, which I cannot talk about today be simply because they have not been analyzed. And the reason they haven't been analyzed is that they, that they will be analyzed at the time the sister study, the ZOE 70 study in people 70 and above, is completed in order to have maximal power to really uh, uh, draw conclusions on the data. So these secondary objectives that I can't talk about today, but that, that we look forward to seeing the data on at some point in the future, are efficacy in reducing PHN, uh, and as well as other complications of herpes zoster, um, efficacy in reducing mor uh, mortality, morbidity, uh, zoster-associated pain, uh, use of pain medications, impact on quality of life, and very importantly, uh, humoral and cellular immunogenicity. Okay, so this is just a brief top-line overview of the design of this efficacy study. So this is a randomized, observer-blind, placebo-controlled study that's being conducted in, in uh, 18 countries around the world. The population is adults 50 years and above, stratified according to the age groups I mentioned, and the primary exclusions are people with a history of zoster, people who had a previous vaccination for either varicella or zoster, or people with significant you know, compromising conditions. There are two study groups, very simple design. One group that received the uh, investigational vaccine and one group that received placebo, which in this case was a placebo, a saline solution, randomized one-to-one -one between those groups. The intervention was two doses of either vaccine or placebo given by intramuscular injection at a two-month interval. And of course, subjects were followed at various visits. In addition to the vaccination visits, they were seen one month after the second vaccination and at yearly intervals for three years after that. And at uh, months where they did not have a visit, they were contacted by phone to uh, solicit uh, safety data and, any, um, and to prompt any uh, reporting of suspected herpes zoster cases. Okay, before I get into the results specifically, I did want to just say a couple words about the herpes zoster case confirmation pathway because that's the primary endpoint of the study and so obviously of great uh, significance. So subjects were educated at the beginning of the study and at every opportunity thereafter to recognize a suspected case of herpes zoster, which for the purposes of this study uh, was defined as a new unilateral rash accompanied by pain broadly defined and no alternative diagnosis. So if they had something that seemed to meet that definition, they were asked to return to their study site within 48 hours. They would be evaluated at that point by the, the, the study investigator. If he or she thought it was clearly not zoster, that's fine. They were sent home. If the investigator thought that it might be zoster, then that triggered a, an evaluation uh, that included collection of samples from the rash for PCR evaluation, as well as a digital photograph of the rash. The samples were then tested uh, by qPCR. If they were positive, the case was considered positive for VZV. The case was considered confirmed for herpes zoster. If they were negative with appropriate controls, it was considered not zoster. And if it was indeterminate for any reason, then the, then it, the final adjudication was according to the so-called herpes zoster adjudication committee, which consisted of five uh, zoster experts uh, not, uh, not affiliated with GSK or with the study otherwise um, for the final uh, case determination. Okay, so the results of this study were actually derived by the analysis of three specific cohorts for our purposes today, okay? So the first cohort is the total vaccinated cohort, which includes all subjects who received at least one dose of vaccine. This included 15,411 people with a mean follow-up time of three and a half years, and this was the primary cohort for the safety analyses, okay? The second cohort of, of major importance is the so-called modified total vaccinated cohort. This is the same as the total vaccinated cohort, except that it excluded subjects who did not receive the second dose or who developed zoster within one month after receiving the second dose. Okay, this consisted of 14,759 individuals with a mean follow-up time of 3.2 years, and this was the primary efficacy analysis cohort. Okay, and so in addition to those two cohorts, we we uh, had another cohort, which was a so-called diary card cohort. These were people who were evaluated in more detail for any uh, reactions to the vaccine. And even though this was a subgroup of the total vaccinated cohort, it was quite a large subgroup with 8,900 individuals. And as you can see on the right-hand side, these, uh, these cohorts were well distributed uh, between the two uh, arms of the study. 
Okay, so this slide shows the demographic characteristics of the enrollees in this study. So if you look at the column on the far right, you can see that the average age of the enrollees was about 62 years. There was a gender distribution of about 61 to 4, 39 female to male. Uh, most of the subjects, a little over 70%, were white, uh, with most of the remainder being Asian. As I mentioned before, this study was conducted in, in, uh, around the world, but about half the subjects were enrolled in Europe, um, and the remaining subjects were enrolled in either Asia, Australia, Latin America, or North America. Okay, so this slide shows the vaccine uh, efficacy results for the study in the primary efficacy analysis cohort, namely the modified total vaccinated cohort. So recall that the uh, primary objective of the study was vaccine efficacy in people 50 and above. So if you look at the top data line, you will see that the, uh, the efficacy numbers for that population. And what you can see in the far right is that the vaccine efficacy in this group was 97.2 percent with, uh, with confidence intervals from uh, almost 94 percent to 99 percent. So the efficacy was calculated uh, by comparing the uh, incidence rates in the vaccine and the placebo groups. And so you can see that in the placebo group, the incidence rate was 9.1 zoster cases per thousand person years. In the, in the vaccine group, it was 0 0.3 cases per thousand person years. And if you want a, an even more concrete um, understanding of the data, you can simply look at the number of cases and see that in the placebo group, there were 210 zoster cases confirmed. In the vaccine group, there were six cases confirmed. Okay, now the other secondary endpoints that I can describe today, as I mentioned, are the vaccine efficacy in the different pre-specified age cohorts, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, and 70 plus. Okay, and those are the next three uh, rows in the table. And if you just move your eyes over to the right-hand column, you, you basically see that the, the efficacy for each of the age cohorts was essentially identical to the overall efficacy, ranging from 96.5% to almost 98%, but with no real difference, um, indicating that there was no um, indication from this study that vaccine efficacy uh, declined with the age of the subject at the time of initial vaccination. Okay, and then simply for completeness, we also show the vaccine efficacy in people 60 and above, which was 97.6% or basically in the same range. Uh, just to remind you, in case it went by too quickly before, this is with a mean follow-up time. Okay, and that that actually is an, it brings me to the next important point, which is the durability of the vaccine efficacy. Now, what may not be entirely clear to you, because it is complicated, is that this this study is actually still ongoing. Okay, it's still blinded at the subject level. We, the analyses were done by external blinded statisticians at the group level, but because there are so few cases in the um, breakthrough cases of zoster in the vaccine group, we cannot actually, by we, I mean the study team, cannot actually be provided with the year-by-year -year efficacy numbers without unblinding us at the subject level. So, we, so I cannot show you those numbers now. I don't have them. But what I can show you is this table that was provided by the external statisticians in which they uh, confirmed to us that the vaccine efficacy in each of the four follow-up years into the study was at least 90 percent, and they further commented that there's no apparent waning of vaccine efficacy during years one through four of follow-up within the study. Okay, so let me move on to safety then. So this slide shows the, um, uh, the uh, comparison of the vaccine and placebo group for three separate safety parameters, namely SAEs, serious adverse events, uh, PIMDs, which stands for Potential Immune Mediated Diseases and Deaths. Uh, the blue bar is the vaccine group. The green bar is the placebo group. On the left-hand side, you see the numbers for the duration of the study. On the right-hand side, you see the numbers for the first 30 days post-vaccination. And uh, without going to each individual um, column, I think you can, you can see that there is no... Um, uh, imbalance between the uh, these safety endpoints between the vaccine and placebo group, either when considered over the duration of the study or during the 30 days immediately after vaccination. Okay, um, here I'm showing you the reactogenicity numbers for this study. Now this slide shows the local solicited local reactogenicity uh, within the first week after vaccination, and this includes pain, redness, and swelling. 
what you can see on the left-hand side is that about 80% of subjects had something within the first week after vaccination, most of the most common uh, local ad adverse event being pain, um, compared to about 12% in the placebo group. Um, of these, about 9.5% had so-called grade 3 pain on a scale of zero, 0 to 3. The, the median duration of local symptoms overall was three days. The median duration of grade 3 symptoms was one day for pain and two days for redness and swelling. Okay, if we look, and this is, shows the exact same type of data, but only for, but for general reactions. Again, about two-thirds of subjects had some general reaction during the course of the study, with a bit less than one-third in the placebo group having some reaction. The most common reactions in the vaccine group were myalgia, uh, fatigue, and headache. Um, the median duration of general reactions was two days for fatigue, gastrointestinal symptoms, headaches, and myalgia, and one day for fever and shivering. And the median duration of of any of, the, of grade three symptoms, regardless of which category, was one day. Okay, so before I conclude, uh, I just wanted to mention um, a couple words about some of the things that we're expecting and planning in the, uh, in the relatively immediate future. So as I alluded to, uh, we, are, we are still awaiting the results of the ZOE 70 study, the sister study in people 70 years of age and above. And when we have those results, those data will, of course, be analyzed, and then they will also be analyzed in combination with the results from the ZOE 50 study. Okay, so this will provide us with additional information on vaccine efficacy in people over 70. It will also provide us with vaccine efficacy data against PHN, zoster-associated pain, uh, impact on quality of life, and, and immunogenicity, and, and some other stuff as well. Uh, we're also eagerly awaiting um, the efficacy results in the autologous stem cell transplant study, which is a true efficacy study, as I mentioned. And then, of course, the, the several ongoing um, supporting studies like the co-administration studies and the safety and immunogenicity in immunocompromised people. Um, in addition to those things which, which, we're, which, are, which we're waiting for directly, we also plan to conduct long-term post-vaccination follow-up of the vaccine recipients in order to get a, as, as good an idea as we can of the longer-term uh, efficacy. And we will also do this, this other studies such as um, uh, following up on some of our earlier studies for long-term immunogenicity outcomes. We'll look eventually in the near future at um, the boostability of the vaccine you know, at, at uh, remote times after the initial course, and we will uh, do additional studies to assess the impact of the vaccine-associated reactogenicity on quality of life, normal daily activities, and so forth. So just to summarize the results, the vaccine efficacy in older adults, 50 and above, was 97.2% in this study. The efficacy appeared to be age-independent and fully preserved in people who received the vaccine at age 70 or older. The efficacy uh, does not wane during the study period. There is no imbalance in the incidence of safety endpoints between the vaccine and placebo groups within this study. And local and systemic reactions to the uh, candidate vaccine are common in the first seven days after vaccination. The large majority are mild to moderate in intensity and of short duration. So that's, that's all for me. And so I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we can open up for uh, questions. Yes, Dr. Rubin. Uh, that was very impressive efficacy. Just a question on the adverse effects. Was there any acceleration, uh, uh, worsening of adverse effects on dose two versus dose one or vice versa? No, I'm, I'm sorry. It was a little hard for me to catch that. Is, is the, uh, the adverse effects um, after vaccination worse for dose two than dose one? No, the, the, the uh, incidence of adverse events does not change from dose two to dose one. No. And Dr. Romero. So very nice study. Inter very interesting results. I was struck by the by the paucity of of uh, minority population in your study. Is there anything to are you going to try to increase that number in any way? Well, if, if, if by minority you, you refer specifically to to African American or so forth, yeah. The study enrolled about um, two thousand subjects or so in the United States, and the and um, obviously there was. The proportion of minorities who enroll is dependent largely on the study sites and so forth. 
Um, clearly, we'd like to see more minorities in, in future studies. Other uh, questions here? Uh, along this line, uh, do you have a projection in terms of uh, submission uh, to FDA? Well, I'll, I'll defer to my, to my colleague here, Len Friedland, to answer that. Hi, uh, Leonard Friedland from GSK. It's too early to speculate on when we'll be submitting the file, but as soon as the study reports are ready, we'll be eagerly submitting them to the regulatory agencies for review. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shukat. I just wondered if you could comment on uh, plans to look at the question of um, previous uh, Zostavax receipt uh, patients. Well, we, we, we do have plans to evaluate the, this vaccine in people who previously received Zostavax. So yes, we, that is a, is a specific plan that we're targeting. And, and another question, uh, not, not covered at all, but, but you, you have some uh, work going down to age 18. Uh, from what you show, this appears to be a, a very immunogenic vaccine. Any uh, work being done to consider uh, use as a pediatric vaccine uh, for primary uh, protection from chickenpox? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I can tell you that, that as, of, as of now, we don't have any plans to, um, te to test this vaccine as an alternative to the currently available vaccines, but it is an interesting question. Uh, Dr. Moore. Just very quickly, I, I think some of us back here are, are, just want to say, wow, that's really exciting, um, because it seemed well, like we were you. all a little blasé. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. One more question uh, for uh, Dr. Uh, Harpez. Um, although you said there's really no explanation for this increase over time, uh, is there any speculation? Uh, as to why we might be seeing this? Speaking personally, I've given this a lot of thought <laughs> and looked at every possible explanation that I've ever considered or heard, and no, not really. It does not, I will just highlight that it is. it does not appear to me and others at this point in time that it's associated with the varicella vaccine program and the external boosting phenomenon that some people have speculated might be causing the increase. But in particular, the increase started occurring preceding the onset of the varicella vaccine program, and it's been seen in several other countries. So, and Dr. Rangel. Sorry, don't we have an increasing prevalence of immunocompromising conditions in people living with things that increase the risk of a good point, but the studies that I'm referring to have controlled for immunocompromised status and even controlled for um, chronic disease status. So, and, and again, you know, as somebody who over the last uh, 25 years now has seen their practice age, um, where now my pediatric practice are people in their 40s, uh, basically th this is something we do see uh, routinely uh, in, in older patients, and it has incredible effects on quality of life. And so I, I think it's an important thing. So w one of the um, kind of thoughts out there, and we have no control over manufacturers and, and price points and so on, but having a more affordable vaccine uh, would be really desirable. Uh, in my practice, I'm always struck, I've said this before, that virtually Every one of my elder patients, and I have a very ethnically and racially diverse practice, they know about this vaccine, but the problem is the ability to pay. And this is one where uh, I can assure you that there are economic disparities that go on every day uh, in, in our practices. So, But uh, I think what you present here is very encouraging. Dr. Shukat. Yeah, Raphael, in the, in the graph that you showed of the incidence increasing, it looked like the last couple of years it was flattening or even possibly decreasing. And I just wondered if that's a significant difference and if that, you know, you have a thought about that. Um, yes, it's a fascinating observation. We've actually been exploring that to see where it's going now. And um, um, we're, it, it appears that that plateauing in the oldest population seems to be continuing. Um, um, but it depends on the age group. It's very interesting. Uh, 
Any uh, further questions or comments? And I, uh, correct me, I don't believe, uh, Natalie, are there any additional public comments? Uh, then uh, I, I think I can uh, honestly uh, uh, say it's time to close the meeting. I'm going to finish up with uh, two lines from uh, Shakespeare's, the, the last two lines from Shakespeare's last uh, uh, play. So, as he from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. Uh, thank you very much for all of your service here um, and for people sticking around. And also, everyone uh, travel safely to your homes. Take care now.